I'm in search of conversation guests. If you are interested or know someone that might be interested, please contact me directly. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chen. Hi, my name is Chen. So, so what do you do? What do you do at NAMI? Des describe yeah. your role. Um, so currently, I'm the executive director of NAMI. So mm -hmm. I do a lot of administrative work, but a lot of presentations also, where we're going out into the community and uh, developing partnerships and networks to be able to expand our programs to let people know that we exist and how we can help the community. Is there so NAMI stands for National. Alliance on Mental Illness. Yes, mental illness. Um, nationally, so do you, t you, you just get contact, you know contacts from other states, but you guys don't actually physically par partake in working together? Is that correct? Like as in, you have to, you stuff that's just take care of Nevada, they'll mm -hmm. take care of their state? Yeah, so each local affiliate, we actually have three local affiliates within our state. Oh. So there's a Northern, NAMI Northern Nevada, NAMI Western Nevada, which um, oversees all the rural areas and we're in NAMI Southern Nevada mm -hmm. and then we also have a state organization that kind of oversees the local affiliates but each affiliate operates as its own nonprofit its own 501c3 with its own board of directors but we do collaborate a lot within our um, state affiliates and across states also just because our programs are very similar our signature programs are the same across the board mm -hmm. so we have our signature programs which is developed by our national organization. And um, we'll, you know, be, we're on an ED listserv together. We have um, meetings and things like that where we'll share ideas and ask what other organizations are doing. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll collaborate in that sense. But what we do is for our local community. When you mention NAMI to just random people, they usually don't know what it is, I'm guessing, just the average person. Um, just on the streets or friend, new friends that you meet? I would say it really depends. So in a city or area where their NAMI is really strong and mm. there's a huge mental health awareness that people will know about NAMI. So I've been in other areas where people are like, oh yeah, I've heard about NAMI and they know their local affiliate because they're so out there in the community. In our state and in, especially in our county and city, um, not too many know about it yet but we are starting to gain some momentum and some awareness so that people are starting to recognize who, who we are, what we do, um, and the fact that we're just here to serve and raise mental health awareness. So mm -hmm. in our community, we're not there yet, but we're definitely getting there. Yeah, what, what do you see as your primary objective with NAMI currently? Just um, to get awareness, to get uh, funding, to get for government to send more funding? I don't even know anything mm -hmm. about it, so you could, Answer however you want. I'm just asking. And All the above. <laughs> All the above. So I would say that um, this year we really spent a lot of time rebranding and getting our word out there, developing relationships within the community. Next year we do have a big focus on funding just because a large portion, um, over 50% of our funding has been cut. And so we're looking to to definitely work on our development because without funding, you know, our positions don't exist and therefore it'd be difficult to go out and continue the work that we do. Um, but we still have a focus on expanding our programs. Is and it 50% cut that is, was that COVID, uh, affected per se, like funding went down because of COVID in general, or do you think it, is it something pushed from government through other things that's higher up? Like government just doesn't want to fund it or something. I think it does have a big part to do with the pandemic and how much our state has been affected by it and um, the loss in revenue by the state. So yeah, they have cut funding um, for a lot of organizations Gosh, because so of that. With COVID, people getting affected and then the mental illness is uh, affected even more. Gosh, that's a bad time to be cutting 50%. Right, um, exactly. Hmm, where... Gosh, where, where, so you're, you're, almost, do you have to go talk to the government and get more funding and then get more funding per, was that private from private corporations too? 
Mm. So that's a that sounds like a pretty hefty job, a pretty important job and very complicated job to go through. Um, what 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 do you where do you put, spend most of your time then? So yes, um, we are looking at government grants, and luckily that's where our collaboration with other NAMI affiliates, NAMI Western Nevada, NAMI Northern Nevada, and our NAMI state organization are coming together to work on larger grants together. So um, we might have collaboration points where we discuss what our strong suits are because each organization has a strong suit that they're working in. Mm -hmm. um, and our state organization is really working on uh, collaborative grants so that it's a one large grant for all the affiliates. We have looked at other grants, um, but yeah, a big chunk of it is coming from private donors. Um, we have major donors that would donate a large chunk. And then we also have just you know, people in our communities from hospitals to clinics to people who are using our services to people who are mental health advocates who are just donating. Um, and that's what's really helping keeping our organization alive and moving mm. forward. What do you think is the biggest known thing that NAMI does? Or in your opinion, say our district, what, if uh, someone does say they've heard of NAMI, mm. what is normally, what do they mention? Um, I say the top three things we offer is education classes to family and individuals affected by mental health condition. We have support groups, and then we do presentations out in the community to help educate people about mental health and to really raise mental health awareness to destigmatize mental health conditions because so many people are affected by it. The issue in the past is that it's been looked at as a taboo subject, something to not be talked about or to hide away when really the healing comes when people start sharing, when people talk about it, because one of the largest barriers to accessing and getting help is stigma. It's the negative beliefs and views towards people living with mental health conditions. So we could get past and break through that stigma and let people know, hey, it's okay to talk about it. It's okay to get help. Yeah. It actually takes a lot of courage and bravery to get help, and it's not a sign of weakness that we will actually have a community of people who are comfortable reaching out for help when needed, seeing the importance of it, and being able to, to get better rather than just going down this dark hole and not finding a way out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and the last podcast I mentioned um, where I think America's, this, this has to do with physical, uh, um, like if you have a, 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 if your arm was chopped off to do, due to some complications, but you don't really see it in public. You don't see people's arms. You don't see their, they either cover it up or they have a prosthetic, but even that's covered up. Um, I had like seven, eight years ago, I had a, a ben, benign cyst here and um, that I was able to like reflect on myself, not wanting to talk about it. Cause I feel like Americans, as soon as you mention something vir virus, bacteria or an abnormality, um, I feel like people kind of like, whoa, I don't want to hear about it, or they, they have some stigma. And I think mental health is even harsher in the sense that people have a harsher stigma on mental health than, say, a physical abnormality. Um, I think the more we talk about it, the more we can make it open. I think the better that it is for everyone, but I don't know how we... Uh, do, you, do you see that in your work where when you, when you bring it up, people... I guess in your world, you see more people that are open to help it out, to help mental illness, to help people with mental Ill illnesses. But do you see people that react negatively? Oh, yeah, of course. Is it? There's still a lot of stigma out there. Um, and so if you look at the history of psychology, back decades and decades ago, when someone did have a mental health condition, before all the research that we know now and all the new knowledge that we've gained and the fact that recovery is possible, people were just kind of locked away in institutions and that was kind of their life sentence. And they didn't know about all the tools that we know now. We, they didn't know, you know, all the therapy tools. And now that we have these, these knowledge of cognitive behavioral therapy or even sometimes medication can help or a lot of mindfulness practice, a lot of self-awareness and being able to intervene when these triggers start can actually really help people. It takes a lot of self-awareness, but 
But because that mindset was instilled in us decades ago, it, take, it just takes a long time to educate the public on these new modalities because sometimes people still think that, oh, you have a mental health condition and that's the end of it. You can't work, you can't do anything. When in fact, there's actually hundreds and thousands of people out there right. living with mental health conditions. And it's more of a spectrum, not a... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so people still do react negatively but that's where presentations come into play and stories come out. And when people are sharing, yeah, I live with a mental health condition and this is how I've you know, recovered from it. And these are the tools that I use to be able to stay mentally well and have a focus on that mental wellness aspect. Um, hopefully that'll change the attitudes of people towards mental health conditions and people who are affected by it to eventually understand that, you know, it's just a normal process of life. Yeah. What do you find the most challenging at, at working at NAMBI? Um, the most challenging, um, I think it's still the stigma because I get mm -hmm. a lot of phone calls and a lot of families coming in in desperate need of help and not knowing where to turn. Just imagine if it was your parent, your mother or father or sibling or son or daughter who's struggling from a mental health condition and the families are calling in and they could be in severe psychosis. They could be isolated and locked in their room for weeks at a time mm -hmm. or just in really bad shape, but they're not able to get them help. When, when should someone contact NAMI? And I think that's a kind of big, but it, yeah. Yeah, I would say anytime they are ready to look for support, to find support and help, um, it, their loved one doesn't necessarily have to have a diagnosis and neither do they if they're affected by it. But if they're, they find that they're struggling with their mental health and they just need support, um, support groups is a great way to get started because we have weekly support groups virtually at this moment. And it's just a way to, to meet other people who've been through it. And the group leaders are people who've lived through it as well and have recovered. So it's a lot of information sharing. It's a lot of um, you know, just offering support and encouragement in a non-judgmental space. It's a safe space for people to just share what they're going through and even for family members. So not just for the individuals, um, living with the mental health condition, but family members. And we have education classes too. So when there's an education class, they could sign up for that. Oh, so you're saying like if, uh, little, little Timmy has some type of mental illness, his mom who may not know exactly what it is can go ask about it or are you saying that the mom should contact nami to get timmy there or should the mom go first um how old is little timmy in this case <laughs> oh, 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 I, I play uh play all three scenarios like a child to someone that's a young adult to someone that's a, a yeah so we touch all ranges um the reason why i ask is because if little timmy was 18 or over we do have support groups for timmy as well um we're working on youth support groups i know nami's across in other states have youth support groups and things like that at this moment we're still working on that but we do have education classes for the parents supporting um youth under 22 and then we have a separate education class based off the same concepts and same ideas, but for um, parents with adult children, parents, caregivers, um, just because they have a slightly different challenges, one with the school system and one as an adult. But there, there are education classes formatted in eight week classes, six to eight weeks, depending on which education class we're talking about. And those are start as a cohort. So you start with the same class, you end with the same class. And each week there's a different topic that they learn about. You read about the topic and then you have discussions on it. But you could start out, families can start out with support groups first as just, um, there's a structure to it still, but you're not reading material per se. You're just there to, to be able to connect with other family members and to talk and express, you know, those challenges that they've been facing. Were, if someone were to not know if they should contact NAMI or not, is that... Uh, have, do you get someone that calls in and says, hey, I don't know if this is the right place? Mm -hmm. Okay, so kind of maybe walk me through what the common questions when they call in or, or do they do they usually walk in or call in? Uh, well, call. Now, call, yeah. Even, even before the pandemic call. Mm -hmm. with, okay, so what, kind of walk me through a, a general common 
a call that would come in and then how that goes? Yeah, so anyone who visits our website, it's um, www.namisouthernnevada.org. They can find all the information on there. They'll find the contact information for our helpline. So our helpline doesn't only connect people to resources that we offer as a nonprofit, the services that we offer, but if, say, we often get phone calls of families or individuals having housing issues or not having health insurance and needing mental health care. Oh, um, so you, it, it, it's a broader spectrum. I, I, need to, yeah, yeah. I need to ask, like, or not, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm probably thinking just the mental health on like an individual but you're, you're saying in insurance housing so anyways yeah tell me the whole spectrum afterwards. yeah yeah <laughs> definitely so we don't offer clinical services meaning that our groups and education classes are not led by i mean they could possibly led be led by people with mental health professional degrees but it's led by people with lived experience so it's a peer-to-peer -peer program meaning that this family member or this individual has been affected by mental health personally lived through it they go through our training which has been developed by our national organization has been vetted um, a lot of the programs are evidence-based listed on um, one of our federal program stamps says evidence-based although they may be may or may not be people with clinical degrees or backgrounds um, but anyway so they call in and we don't provide the clinical services we provide the education and support groups but if someone did need housing information or healthcare information or um, you know very specific uh, programs or services that we don't offer the person people who operate our helpline as well as our facilitators our volunteers are all trained in our community resources so that they can direct this person and say okay here's the website that you would go to to apply for Medicaid or here's an organization that can help you with um, specifically with substance use disorder or here's an organization that can help you with um, if your kid has autism or you know there's specific groups that will help family members in this area that may be a better fit or if it's a housing issue they could go to the housing Southern Nevada Housing Authority and um, fill out an application there so we also have a resource line that will help pe connect people to the resources that they need in the community. If I were to ask you to make a uh, one, two or three sentence short description on the question, who should con contact NAMI? Mm -hmm. Is that tough for like, cause it sounds like there's healthcare, there's mental illness, uh, family Yeah, I member. could probably say in one word, anyone and everyone. Anyone and everyone, <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, there's no, um, I mean, the only tricky part is probably youth under 18 at the moment. Um, but we're trying to figure out a way how, of how we can service youth under 18. But any adult that calls in for any type of mental health care need, and we all have mental health, mm -hmm. kind of like how we all have dental, vision health, mm -hmm. uh, physical health. It's just another part of our body. So anyone who's looking for resources or needs help can call into our organization um, and we'll direct them to the resources in the community or connect them to the services that we provide. What would you say, what type of people are, in your opinion, get the most help out in NAMI? I would say um, individuals and family members or caregivers, and it doesn't have to be blood related, it could be friends also, like if you know somebody was a roommate and they were living with a friend that had a mental health condition, they wanted to learn how to help them, that could work as well. Um, someone who's looking for support because oftentimes these challenges this person might feel very isolated they're alone they don't know who to reach out to or even their closest friends and family members might not quite understand what they're going through and might come off a little bit more judgmental and is um you know it's sometimes it could be more hurtful having those conversations and not getting the support that they need so they would come to us to because we've built a whole community of people who understand and aren't here to judge, um, to really find that support. Because sometimes all it really takes is just a listening ear to be able to talk about it. Yeah. There are people who have gone through this for a decade or two decades sometimes and have never really fully opened up of what their experience has been. And family members and caregivers need healing just as much as a person affected by mental health conditions because the family members are struggling watching their loved ones deteriorate yeah. 
yeah. and feeling so helpless and not knowing what to do. And there's a lot of shame and guilt that goes into it. So helping families and individuals kind of work through all the difficult emotions that comes up when it, when it comes to mental health conditions with our loved ones. What are some of the best experiences, you, experiences that you've seen someone kind of go through NAMI, uh, like how they started with NAMI and then they're maybe a year or two out? What are some of the most interesting stories that you've seen with that? Yeah, I mean, they're like the success stories. There are people who've come through the organization and have really made a 360 kind of thing. Or is it 180? Because they don't want to go back to the starting <laughs> point. 180, not a 360. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but just coming out of the program and really understanding, first of all, just the basics of mental health conditions, that it isn't quite anyone's fault. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes, either the individual or family members will blame themselves. So watching family members go through our education course, and then by the end of it, say, wow, I had no idea that, you know, these things that I was saying and doing wasn't really helpful. And then hearing the stories of the difference in how they communicate with their loved ones and what difference that made, or people who go through the program and live with the mental health challenge to say, okay, now I know that recovery is possible. And so at the end of it, there's always hope that the people leave with saying, okay, recovery is possible. It's going to take a lot of work, but it's not a death sentence to have a mental health condition. And that's, it's just a general theme of what I see from families and individuals throughout the years over and over again. Is there, um, uh, donations from people that were that did partake in NAMI before, or or from family members. Oh yeah. You, you've seen, have you heard? Have you heard when they donate and they they say something about uh, either themselves or their family member? I would say for confidentiality reasons, I usually don't share fully the stories. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, usually, we need you know permission ahead mm -hmm. of time to be able to share specific stories and things like that. But things that I share are pretty common, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess the best one I could use is myself as an example. Because um, I started the with the organization about eight years ago um, in my early 20s. Um, my grandmother and my mother lived with mental health conditions and it was really tough. So I had, I assumed that parent-child role at a very young age. And I remember going to the counseling and psychological support services at Cal State Long Beach and coming up to them one year and saying, I need help because this has been going on since I was a teen. I've had to find housing for my grandmother every year and it was really challenging and tough. And I felt like I was having a mental breakdown because of the stressors of you know, the start of work, school, and just all the personal life. And, and when I went to them, they said, okay, here's a pamphlet for NAMI. This one, this group helps family members supporting loved ones with mental health conditions. Why don't you go check them out? I remember thinking, I don't know about support groups. Like I had that self stigma over yeah, yeah, a decade yeah, ago yeah, and thinking, yeah, yeah. it's kind of weird. I don't know these people. How can I just walk into a room of strangers and just tell them my life story? What are they going to think of me? And it took me about a year before I finally came to another break where there was just a crisis after crisis. So I signed up for the family to family education class, not really knowing what I got myself into. I was the youngest one there, um, probably the only Asian person there. My mm. sister joined me. She was only 16 at the time. And luckily they allowed her to come with me. Usually if you're under 18, you can't join unless you have a parent or guardian, um, possibly. but. My sister joined with me and it was a breakthrough in just how I understood and saw mental health conditions because before that, I didn't know anyone else who was going through the same thing I was. But as I sat in the room, every single person that was sharing their story that first um, couple of sessions, I just thought, wow, that's my life. They're sharing my story. It could just, it's just a different person, but similar challenges, similar experiences, similar emotions. And so by the end of it, luckily, 
the instructor of the course tapped my shoulder and said, hey, you know, we know you have a teaching background and would you be interested in becoming a teacher for this course? There's a three-day training. And I said, absolutely, I, I would love to. So I did the three-day training and went back and volunteered that same year and taught a course. And it's, it's completely changed my life because every single class I learn something new, even though I'm teaching it. But then I see the difference that it's making in other people because everyone's always so grateful by the end of it. And even throughout the class where you could see the light bulbs going off of, wow, I had no idea because they're reading and learning about the subject that they don't get anywhere else. When they, when they check their family member into a mental health institute or ER or hospital, or whatever it is, there's no one to sit down with these families to say, hey, let me educate you so you could understand and help this person better. Mm -hmm. Usually they're left in the dark. So because I learned and understood mental health conditions, it changed the way that I communicated with my loved ones. It changed the way that I saw. So I learned that I can't control them, even if they don't want the help, because you could only do so much. I can change how I respond and react to them. Mm -hmm. We teach family members how to set boundaries and have self-care in addition to communication skills. And from that, I just got more and more involved and um, continued volunteering, taught over seven classes over the years with over dozens of families and um, got involved on the board and eventually became an employee. And mm -hmm. that's how I made it to where it's I like Student to. goes to, becomes the teacher. <laughs> exactly. So and that's, like, I think, how a lot of uh, participants join our organization as volunteers eventually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, if someone were to say, what's the, or if, if I, I guess, what's the difference between, I guess I'll just say it, what's the difference between a uh, kind of like going to a psych, uh, psychologist or psychiatrist? psychologist, psychiatrist, and then what would be the difference of them going to NAMI? What would your, if someone were to ask that, how would... Yeah, thanks for asking that. So that's a great question. And I also want to different, differentiate between psychologists and psychiatrists because a lot of people actually don't know. They don't know what's the difference between like a social worker or marriage, family therapist, psychologist, psychiatrist. Psychiatrist goes to med school. So they are able to prescribe medication and they look at the person and their behaviors from a very... A medical biological perspective um, psychologists I mean they also look at it from a biological perspective but they depending on the state they may or may not be able to prescribe medication um, they do a lot of diagnostic testing and all that and really look at the person they may or may not do therapy um, talk therapy um, so depending on where they're at uh, and which system they're in they they would do the therapy according to whatever role that they're in. And same thing with marriage, family therapists, social workers, they all do therapy in some sense. It just depends on the frame of reference that they're looking at it from. Um, and I would say that for people to go, when they come to our organization, it's finding community and finding peer support and education. When they go to a psychiatrist or psychologist, they're going for their, they might be going for their individual therapy or diagnostic um, assessments um, for medication or whatever it is. So we don't provide the medication. And like I said before, we're not a clinical provider, um, but we're complementary to what all those services are. So what I would suggest for an individual um, struggling with mental health conditions is that they have their own therapist or psychiatrist, psychologist, whoever they see, and then they would come to us to our weekly support groups for weekly support or to our education class for additional support. Um, so our goal is to really collaborate with hospitals and other clin clinics and providers to be able to provide these complementary services within their institution. So whether it's a small clinic, we could hold support groups if they have space for us, or a large hospital, um, a behavioral health hospital, um, we could hold support groups and education classes there as well. So they would be going to both. And even for family members who are supporting loved ones, because there's a lot of um, secondary trauma sometimes that goes into caring for a loved one living with a mental health condition. So I believe as a family member that 
it's also important for family members to get the help and the therapy to kind of work through the challenges that they, they have to live with and face every day. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have family where I think um, if they were to partake in NAMI or even a psycho psychologist, psychiatrist, it would really greatly help them. I, I won't get in depth in case they watch this video <laughs> and I won't say who. Um, so would if someone were to be, they think that they need to go see a psychologist or psychiatrist, would it be better for them to start out kind of at NAMI first and then kind of talk to people and then maybe the people there would tell them, yeah, maybe you should go see a psychiatrist or normally you're saying it should be also almost com um, complementary at the same time, like meaning they should probably already go to a psychologist and they should also be visiting NAMI at the same time probably? Um, so I would say it just really depends on the person. Okay. What I've seen, I wouldn't say anything's better or worse. To me, getting help is getting help. So yeah. any way, any place that they can start is right where they need to be. I know for me, I had a lot of self-stigma. So for me going to NAMI first and taking an education course and talking to people was a way for me to kind of chip away at that stigma slowly over time until I finally said, okay, I, I actually need to go see a therapist for myself. And that took years and years. For some people, they might dive in and say, you know what, I need to see a therapist, or sometimes the, their symptoms or conditions might be so bad that they do need that right away, and then they learn about NAMI after. Um, so either way, but when they do come to NAMI, they will get you know, support from other families, and they might be able to get you know, suggestions of where to go, who to talk to, um, steps or what actions to take. So they definitely can get that support in the group as well. So either way, as long as they're making a an effort or a stride and taking that step forward in the direction of getting help. Um, it really doesn't matter where they start at as long as they start somewhere. Yeah. Do you think this, so this is a personal question and, um, uh, I would imagine the people listening, it, it, it's a racial question. Do you think, um, I don't want to sound like I'm racist, but I'm Asian. So I'm, I think I'm allowed to ask it. Do you think being Asian, uh, because you're, you're full, you're full, full Asian or you're half, are you, um, so my mom's half white, half Vietnamese. My dad's full Vietnamese. Okay. So I'm about three quarters okay. Vietnamese and a quarter white. Do you think being Asian and having the Asian upbringing, the cultural traditions, the mental health is even a heavier stigma than, say, maybe a white person born in America? Uh, or do you find them similar? Or Yes, yeah, so I think a lot of it... Um, I guess you can kind of tie race to it. It has to, a lot to do with education and cultural beliefs. So I know for me growing up, the first time that I you know, witnessed my family members having psychosis and hearing voices or um, seeing depression or anxiety in them, I was told that there's evil spirits and demons you know, um, surrounding them and I think it, it might be rooted to a very cultural belief where um, there's spirits and you know the demon world and all that stuff and and believing in ghosts and whatnot. So for a long time I, I believed in that growing up until I learned about psychology, which is a more westernized so culturally it's embedded in our culture to understand um, you know, psychology and human behavior from this biopsychosocial perspective because the philosophers or the people who came up with these concepts were you know more westernized um, so i think that that education is a big piece of it because um, even whether it's in asia or in america there are people that you'll find that understands the biopsychosocial factor or model of it um, regardless of whatever race they are here or there and there are people who will see it from the I don't know if you consider it cultural spiritual or whatever it is um, but all races have at some point will see that I yeah I'm trying to figure out what it is with the Asian culture um, where there's this huge stigma and Maybe just the lack in research or understanding. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm going to guess right now. I'm going to guess 
the Asian culture has such a prideful, prideful way of life where going to a psychologist or a psychiatrist is that means that you failed. Like if that person thinks that they should go, they've everyone else would look at them as a failure or they'll think of themselves as a failure. And I think that's the I think that's the wrong thing to do for a culture or for anyone. It doesn't matter culture. But I think Asian culture seems to have that somehow embedded. There's a prideful mm -hmm. thing in the culture somehow. Yeah, that's a great point that you bring up because I think there's a lot to do with the collectivistic culture, right? There's this thing about um, respect of our elders and bring shame and disgrace to the family. So, you know that one word in Vietnamese where if you're, if you're behaving or acting out, which can be seen that way, especially with someone with mental health symptoms um, or conditions with these symptoms that looks that way, um, but they're truly just struggling and need help, it could be seen as your parents didn't raise you well. Yeah, exactly. But that's kind of like embedded into our culture, what you're saying. Um, and so there's a lot of guilt and shame that's placed on the families for someone having a mental health condition. Mm -hmm. And again, I think it might just go back to that. It's that mix of culture, what our cultural history is, and then the lack of education or knowledge around mental health, because it's a fairly new field. Yeah. Even in America, we're barely learning it and um, understanding it better, but there's still a lot of stigma out there. Um, yeah, I think you mentioned uh, before that when you spent time in India, how many, was it, in, I think it was India, mm -hmm. or maybe it was Vietnam, I forget which of the two, where you said the amount of, um, I think it was mental illness clinics of some sorts. I, I think you mentioned something along, maybe, I don't know if you saw that when you're there, or you're just researching numbers on Google, seeing how many clinics that they have and their their government, how much they know about it, how much they spend money on it. I think that's really interesting. It probably takes a certain, in, in America where we have so much money, there's takes amount of money, a certain amount of money to be able to invest for the government to have the money to invest in a mental illness program. Um, I'm guessing maybe in Vietnam that, that, that amount is probably really low. I'm guessing, I don't know. Yeah, I'm curious to know too. I would love to find out, but I'm not 100% sure on that. I just, I also think of it as a collectivistic culture Families are really embedded into each other's lives there because you see each other every day, especially in Asian countries where, you know, the whole community knows everyone. Yeah. And so everyone's kind of in everyone's business. Mm -hmm. And and I think that stigma still runs rampant where, oh, if something's happening or something's going on, they kind of just tuck that family member away and hide them and don't want them to know and and here in America, it's a more individualistic culture where um, it's also easier to hide and say, okay, well, this person just stays at home and they don't go out to the family gatherings or they don't go out to, to friends gathering or whatever it is. Um, so it's interesting to see it from that perspective of a collectivistic versus an individual. And perhaps maybe being more collectivistic, they have more opportunities to open up and share. Um, but I don't know how much it's talked about in Asian countries. Yeah, yeah. Is NAMI mostly um, supported by government funding or is it, do you, do you guys have to go find 100% of your funding or how does that work out or how challenging is all that too? So we do have to go out and find 100% of our funding. 100%, holy cow. Um, depending on which city or which affiliate, because every affiliate is responsible for their own finances. Because um, even getting government funding, it's not like it's automatically given to you. You have to apply for the grants for government funding. Okay. So you might apply and not get it. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of NAMIs, I would say, are supported by their state organization, like state um, government. And there is also private donations and other grants, private foundations and whatnot, or individual donors. Like every... You know, when people donate ten, twenty dollars, that actually goes into the programs and into the organization. And just imagine, you know, a hundred people or two hundred people giving twenty dollars each. That's enough to fund a program or fund a whole class of curriculum or fund a position that coordinates 
um, the volunteers or whatever it is. Um, so we re rely heavily on, I would say, all aspects. And for our organization, we do have all areas of um, individual donations, corporate donations, major donors, um, state grants, and other grants as well. What is the biggest section of those grants? Is it mainly single one-time donations, or do you guys? Is it mostly corporations with monthlies, or it probably doesn't. I don't. I don't even know why I'm asking this question. I'm not sure if it really uh, means anything. I guess my train of thought is to ask that, and then ask how, where. Can if someone's in that group, how can they contact you or how can they donate? Do they just go to the website? But anyways, uh, mm. so back up to the where do you feel is the most helpful for NAMI where people donate like certain single individuals or companies or what? Anyone and everyone. Anyone <laughs> any everyone? money, any yeah. money coming in, just even every five dollars from an individual donor. Like I said, if you get a hundred of those or a thousand of those, mm -hmm. that still makes a difference. Um, large corporations can also donate. They would. Yeah, I would say a large um, portion of our our funding used to come from the state. Like I said last year, over 50% of it came from the state. Since about um, two thirds of that funding has been cut, a large portion of our donations come from a major donor, and um, and you know just other small grants, um, individual donors as well as corporate donors. Um, I would say there's a pretty widespread across all three of those um and yeah if you go to our website there's a donate now button where people can just go on there and donate okay. um there's been people who've just called in and connected with me they email me or they somehow find um a way to connect with me either through a presentation that i've given or um, a networking event and and we just kind of talk and they say hey can i send you a check for X amount, like five hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, every bit helps. And so, um, it's, I would say there's multiple ways, but the easiest way is probably just through the website. Yeah. Because yeah. then when they do that through the website, they're able to to just log on and put in the amount they want, enter in all their information, and yeah, yeah. What do you think's the most impact impact that Nami has on the on its region or city, like? Um, I guess that, that's going to vary from each. I guess each NAMI uh, satellite or each each city too, huh? Um, what what what's NAMI here in uh, Southern Nevada? What do you feel you guys is your strongest um, activity or project? Yeah, so I said it goes back to those three things: education classes, support groups, and presentations. So if I had to put it overall under one category, it's just mental health awareness. Okay, so spreading the awareness. Awareness to destigmatize mental health conditions. Oh, okay. Because when okay. a community isn't aware and they're not talking about it, mm -hmm. it's that whole taboo hush hush. We don't talk about that, and people in that community who have mental health conditions or struggle with mental health. Um, are just kind of viewed negatively as, oh, you know, whatever discrimination things that take place when someone's viewed negatively also comes with that, whether it's not getting housing, not getting work. Um, but when we have a community who's touched by mental health awareness and understands and, and we go out there and we present not only to clinics, hospitals, schools, justice systems, just to say, one, recovery is possible. And two, you know, the way that we viewed mental health in the past is very different from how we view it today because recovery is possible. We know that people can and will get better and contribute back to society. Um, or there's ways to help and support each other that it's not, we all have emotions and feelings. And over time, prolonged stress or, you know, life changes or um, it could be anything from death of a loved one, grief, which we're experiencing a lot now during the pandemic. It, it could lead to depression, anxiety, um, other mental health conditions as well. Let's talk about it. And looking at the numbers of how many people are affected pre-COVID is about one in four to one in five people that will have or have experienced a mental health condition. That's 25% of the population. If you're sitting in a room with 20 people, you know, a good chunk of those people, a handful, yeah. are living with something. But then 
we're not also thinking of the family members. So even if that person isn't living with the mental health condition themselves, they might know someone or have a family member living with it. But when we're quiet about it, everyone kind of lives in shame and in fear and guilt and oh, there's that isolation. But when we actually start talking about it, we can actually reach out to each other for support. Just imagine being in you know, a company where the culture is open and supportive and when someone's struggling rather than condemning them or um, shunning them or um, firing them. We connect them to the resources that they need. We give them support as a colleague and we talk to them in a way where you know, they don't have to be ashamed of it and then they find their way to recovery much quicker because then they're willing to reach out for help and then they can get back to life as, you know, as whatever they were doing before um, and being productive and just, just living the life where it's fulfilling for them, whatever that looks like, because recovery looks different for everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is, there, is there anything that, any important things about NAMI that I have yet to ask about? Any important key items that you think that would be good to know? Um, can't think of anything off the top of my head right now. Okay. I'm on, I have some online questions that some people asked. Let me try to mm -hmm. pull it up. Uh, this person asks, do you do, deal directly with uh, mentally, cha mentally challenged, mentally ill individuals? Um, do you, are you directly helping them? Yeah, definitely. So that's our support group and education classes. So people who are living with mental health challenges can join the support group and find support from other people who've been there before. And they can take our education classes um, to learn more about, you know, the mental health conditions and learn the tools that they need to recover and to maintain mental wellness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, their next question is um, coupled with it with that last one, uh, how, much, how much do you relate or emphasize with these kids or adults? If they, do they cry in front of you? Um, how can you cry with them if it can't be controlled? Um, so yeah, that's, that's a great question. I would say that that's the beauty of a support group and an education class. Yes, we bring tissues. Well, it was in person. We'd actually bring tissues to every class oh, okay. because people will break down and they will cry. And that's the thing, right? In our society, sometimes people see crying as a weakness or they're afraid to show other people emotions and people oftentimes do it alone when it's actually really healing to, to be able to express our emotions in whatever natural way it comes out and then find the support from others to say, it's okay to feel that way. Yeah. It's, it's completely a normal response to what we're going through to cry. And, you know, oftentimes when one person's triggered and their emotions flow out, it might trigger somebody else's emotions because they're so deeply attached because of their own personal experiences and knowing what that person must be feeling and what they're going through. Yeah. I personally believe that it's healthy to cry and it's healthy to show our emotions oh, and and yeah if if the emotions come out just let it mm. because we need to be able to feel our emotions in order to heal because if not it gets backed up kind of like a drainage system mm -hmm. and all that gunk that gets pushed down that's all the emotions that's just stuck there yeah. in our bodies yeah. but once it's released it's it feels really good so the, uh this person asks, have you seen the 2015 movie Fathers and Daughters with Russell Crowe and Amanda Seyfried? I have not, but I'm interested in watching it now, especially if there's a mental health component to it. Uh, they mention uh, the girl doesn't speak for a year and they're giving psychologists to only two months to, uh, to speak to her. And then if they can't figure it out, they move it to another psychologist afterwards. Um, so it's the story of that psychologist dealing with that girl. Um, mm, sounds interesting. No, but I've seen other great ones like Beautiful Mind, yeah, Silver yeah. Linings Playbook, um, 
Perks of a Wallflower. What what movie do you think depicts mental illness pretty accurately? And then what are some movies that don't <laughs> depict it accurately? Oh, I really love Silver Linings Playbook. Okay. Um, because there's this, you know, you really see the person and, and it doesn't just show that person's symptoms at the moment, but it shows what some of the root causes of their trauma stem from and how it affected them in that present day. But at the end of it, you kind of see this process of recovery of them being able to love again and being able to connect with people again. And, and I feel like that's pretty accurate of, you know, there might be dark times in our lives where we go through these challenges and it's rough, but there's hope afterwards. Um, something that isn't, I'm sure I can think of a lot, but off the top of my head right now. Rain Man? Uh, Try to think. Um, okay, I, I don't know one off the top of my head specifically, but a lot of thriller movies that depicts the psychopath as the killer, I think is very inaccurate because that's media playing into social stigma. People who don't have that personal experience with mental health challenges in their families or loved ones, all they're seeing is one side of the story, which is now there's a stereotype or this thought that, oh, all people with mental health conditions are dangerous or yeah. violent or they're killers. Yeah. Um, and maybe there might be a small population of that, of people who, who do go down that route, but statistics actually show people who have mental health conditions are actually more vulnerable to being victims of violence than actually hmm. um, being the perpetrators of violence themselves. Yeah, yeah. And and yeah, that the way that media portrays people with mental health conditions, in that sense, like the very um, Hollywood or the very uh, over what's the word I'm looking for? Um, over the top, violent. Yeah. Aggressive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, I can't think of a movie off the top of my head, but in general, mm -hmm. movies like that, that's when I, I kind of cringe a bit and I'm just like, Texas Chainsaw no. Massacre 7 or 7? Um, mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Right. Um, how, if, if you're working with someone, how difficult or is it to not personally and emotionally get connected with these people? Or do you, I mean, that's part, I would imagine actually from what I hear, you you kind of want to connect with them. Yeah, so a big role model of mine is Brene Brown. And I read a lot of her books. Uh, I'm currently reading Dare to Lead. But she's this, if you're not familiar with her work, this researcher, um, and she does a lot of organizational development and she talks about vulnerability, especially in the workplace, and building work cultures that support success. And I think in the past, there was a lot of disconnect of this professional field. You keep you know, your private lives out of it. Yes, we're still going to go in there and do the work we need to do and perform, but also having that personal connection and being able to be open with each other and being able to support each other is the culture that I want to create within my organization. And I've seen it in other organizations as well, not always mental health, but I believe that there, there's um, a benefit to being able to connect with each other on a really human level. Yeah, totally. In that sense. Yeah, so. in this concrete jung jungle of a city, I feel that we, as we get bigger and bigger houses, we get further away from humans uh, interacting with each other everything from having lunch with each other having dinner with each other to even at work you're in a cubicle in some offices you're just in a cubicle and everything is so segregated and in, in my opinion it's 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 unhealthy the world that we're building I, yeah I, and i mean business is all about relationship and relationship building um in order to build a genuine connection and relationship there needs to be some form of vulnerability and understanding who the real person is not just the sur on the surface level yep. um so there is some you know sharing that i think just helps our culture because we trust in each other and we're able to support each other because no one's going to be perfect 100 percent of the time yeah. life happens yep. Yep. and being understanding of each other 
um, when those things happen. Of course, you know, there's also a, a balance in that line of, okay, there's work to be done also. Yeah. Um, so I think it is a fine balance to be able to, to do that, but it's possible. Yeah. What's the most pressing mental illness issue in America? Well, right now, because of the pandemic, I think there's a lot of people um, who may not have struggled with anxiety in the past as much, mm -hmm. now finding themselves anxious, um, if not on a daily basis, more often than they were before. Mm -hmm. um, I know depression and anxiety are two of the more known um, mental health conditions that people struggle with or go through um, but definitely anxiety is on the rise but there are ways to cope with it so that's kind of the good thing out of it yeah i think the next question is that what what, what would be a good solution for this um big issue it's really learning about so there's there needs to be some form of self-awareness and that could either go be um accomplished or achieved through self-reading, Googling stuff, right? But really having a therapist there to support you um, and being open about the challenges. There's a lot of tools that I've learned for myself because I also um, deal with anxiety and depression in my life. And there's tools in my toolbox that I've learned over the years. So I could list off like a whole list of things that I do that helps me with my own anxiety. So the moment that I feel my heart start to race and and I start to tremble or, you know, get the fog brain or whatever it is, there's things that I know I can turn to, to be able to cope with those challenges. Yeah. Yeah. Is vanity a mental illness? You know, there, there isn't a specific diagnosis for that, but maybe it could be tied into narcissism. Mm -hmm. um, there is narcissistic personality disorder and things like that. Um, which I don't know too, too much about, but it could, it might be a symptom of it yeah. possibly. Do you think social media causes or exacerbates any mental illnesses? Um, it's interesting because right now I would say, at least from my understanding and my knowledge that there is no known specific cause of mental health conditions. There's just a lot of risk factors, right? Trauma, poverty, having mental illness in the family, um, and just other hardships in life, or sometimes it could be a biochemical imbalance. Um, so there isn't any research that can directly say there's a cause. There's definitely a lot of correlation. So there's a lot of um, correlational research out there, but no direct cause. And social media is a tricky one right now. I know that's kind of been the big talk, especially with social dilemma coming out too. Or and the uh, social dilemma, the the movie, the documentary that yeah, just came out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's it could go either way. It's kind of, the way that I see it, it's kind of like a pencil. We could use it as a tool, and it could do great things. We could also use it to stab somebody's eye out. <laughs> so that's the way that I see social media because I could say for myself, I've learned a lot of the things that I've learned, and. There were times in my life where I really struggled and felt like I didn't know who and where to go to for support. And motivational videos on YouTube was what got me through the day. Hmm. Okay. And I follow people on Instagram, Facebook, things like that, that talks about mental health and how to cope with these challenges. So I'm learning these coping tools and these coping strategies, of course, through my therapist and through reading on Google and reading articles, reading my own books. But then I'm also learning it from the social media groups that I follow or the people that I follow, like the holistic psychologist or the brain coach. Um, and there's uh, one called the Gottman Institute where they actually have examples of what to say instead to be helpful when you know, you're communicating with someone. Um, especially they talk about attachment bonds and attachment styles and how that plays into our current relationships or how trauma affects someone and how to overcome that, um, you know, and what we can do for ourselves and recognize that. So it helps to develop my self-awareness when I'm reacting or behaving a certain way. Um, the flip side of that is I have seen and heard about social media being something that could be addicting or people are looking at just 
you know, the, the great moments in other people's lives and comparing it to their own and, um, just having a very superficial connection and not really having genuine connection with other people because of this social media thing and not, you know, going out and actually talking to people. So I think it could really go either way, depending on how we use this tool to advertise and market and connect. Yeah. Um, cause that's also a way to find groups that we can connect to when they market and say, Hey, this is available and you can be embedded into a community like these Facebook groups. People are really finding community within that. Um, like the Asian Facebook groups that I'm in, I'm like, Oh, they're sharing stories. And for a long time, I thought that I was just the only one that went through this and hearing other people have gone through similar challenges. It really makes me feel not so alone and has helped me kind of have a different perspective on my past and and all that yeah is there a, a nami facebook group and do people um talk about their issues through that so we have a nami facebook page mm -hmm. where it's moderated by our social media manager so she does a lot of the postings and it's just more about you know advertising our groups our events and putting messages out there for mental health awareness so we don't necessarily have a Facebook group yet. We mm -hmm. might have one in the future just because if we do, we want to make sure that it's properly mon um, yeah, monitored, that you know people aren't um, saying things to each other that could be detrimental or anything. Yeah. So, so we don't have the bandwidth for it yet, but hopefully in the future we can build and create a community where people can go in and share um, and also have someone monitor it so that it doesn't go sideways where, yeah, yeah. you know, someone's just going on there being a troll or something. Yeah, that would suck. Yeah. People suck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so we don't have it yet, but maybe in the future. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you think's kind of the, what do you take the most, uh, pride in NAMI? Not even, not, not pride. What, what do you find the most, um, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Like the most fun or the most uh, that you find the, that achieves the most with NAMI or what do you personally feel the most satisfied with NAMI about? I think it just goes back to mental health awareness. Awareness. Getting people to talk about it and letting them know it's okay. Um, and it, it just might be more individualized for me because my background's in teaching. So I've worked a lot with students and just knowing that my depression and anxiety probably started when I was a teen um, I could go back to moments where I recognize the symptoms and see it and understand what it is now. At that time, I didn't know, but I just always go back and think, well, if I would have known at that time and had learned the tools that I learned later on as an adult at that time, how different that would have looked. So a big part of what we do is um, we started a program called Ending the Silence. So we go out to schools and present to students about the different warning signs of mental health conditions. Um, what to look for in themselves or their peers, who to contact, who to reach out to, how to reach out to someone, what to say, what not to say, and really letting them know and understand. And it's for both youth and adults that mental health conditions are part of life that anyone can experience. It doesn't discriminate against race or class or gender, ethnicity, or anything like that. So letting them know that it's okay there's actually very successful people out there, a lot of celebrities who are, you know, struggling with mental health conditions or um, who have recovered from it also. And I think when I see the look on people's faces, when, you know, when we tell them it's okay and, and they're just surprised by how many people, because there's a specific slide that I'm thinking about, especially in the, um, the youth presentation where we have celebrities up there like um, Will Smith and Leonardo DiCaprio, Adele, Lady Gaga, Serena Williams. And we're like, yeah, all these people have, you know, mental health challenges. And would you consider them successful still? And their eyes light up like, yeah. Hmm. And they're just curious, like, what do these people live with? And I'm like, well, it doesn't matter what, what it is. It's just knowing the fact that, yes, you can have a mental health challenge, but there are tools and things that we can do to get better and still be as successful or be able to manage it to, to live out our dreams or whatever it may be. And is I there, think 
that's the that's the best thing of just knowing that that there's hope yeah yeah is there any key indicators on on those if someone's experiencing something that they they should um look into contacting NAMI or a psychiatrist yeah so um just things like you know it's, it's distinguishing between say when we lose someone loss of a loved one that's grief you're going to experience grief and it's going to hit you for some time um but if we experience it for an extended period of time and it gets to the point where it's past two weeks or maybe longer than a month and um we just can't get out of that that dark space or that cloudiness and um not being able not feeling like we're able to connect with friends or people so if there's a loss of interest of what we used to once connect to like for example if i don't know it could be music like all of a sudden we there's a change in behavior there's i think change in behavior is probably one of the biggest indicators so if we stop the hobbies that we used to like if we're not connecting with people and friends if there's changes in sleep so either sleeping way more than we used to so if we're sleeping at an average of seven to eight hours a day and we find ourselves sleeping 10 12 14 hours a day or not being able to sleep so not sleeping enough and waking up throughout the night um, and only getting like three or four hours of sleep whereas before that wasn't the case or changes in appetite not being able to eat or overeating um, isolation is a big thing so again not wanting to connect to people anymore and not not wanting having that motivation to even wake up or to even brush our teeth or our hair or take a shower or make food when things just start feeling like it's overwhelming um it could be having thoughts or hearing things that aren't there and um not knowing where it's coming from could all be early signs and and triggers or um you know warning signs of maybe it's time to talk to someone to get support and get help. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Does uh, NAMI take volunteers? Oh yeah. Our whole yeah. program, all of our programs are ran by volunteers who are teaching the classes, leading support groups, doing presentations. Um, so anyone can volunteer as long as they have that lived experience. Um, they have that lived experience they participate in either a support group or education class and they'll have to go through a training um, depending on which program they're interested in and then they'll be able to to go out and lead a support group or lead an education class or do a presentation i imagine that'd be really rewarding for a volunteer to go through that and kind of actually go from student to teacher to some some degree Oh yeah, it definitely empowers people because if we look at the research also, it shows that one of the ways to break down stigma is to bring lived experience and have those voices out in the community so that people can put a face to the experience and the name and just see that this is just a person. This person has dreams and goals and um, you know they may be working and have a career and have a family um it could very well be our firefighter or our doctor or our teacher or our grocery store clerk anyone in our community could somehow be affected by mental health conditions and we get those people out there to share their story not only are we empowering them to get past that shame that guilt that fear um and help them to gain that confidence to share their stories. But then they know that they're doing it for a greater good to help other people in the community to not only understand them better, but to understand other people better and to understand, and it's for future generations that they're making a difference, that they're doing something worthwhile, that it's making this trickle down effect, right? Because once one person in the family has this new knowledge, understanding or awareness, when they open up those conversations and start talking to their friends and their family members, it could slowly plant that seed of, okay, this person that I really care about and love is opening up about mental health challenges. Sometimes it might be well received, sometimes not, but it starts with a conversation and a dialogue and seeing someone else talk about it first 
kind of gives them that that courage or that momentum or that um, you know ability to open up and talk about it with others. Yeah. And yeah. so, what's the path on like uh, a volunteer? Do they usually come in as a as a, a, a student first per se, or what would you call it? Some of that contacts <clears throat> NAMI. Are they? They're just a guest, a student, a what would we you call We usually call them participant. participant. They could be a student in a okay. class. Participant. Um, um, yeah. So they start uh, as typically a volunteer where they would start out as a participant usually, and then they would um, probably, would they go through months of, of, of courses or gatherings, and then eventually they would decide to become a volunteer? So uh, for our education classes, since they're usually six to eight weeks long, we definitely want them to be able to experience it as a student first. So they would go through the education course, take the course, because it's all people with lived experience, so they have to have some sort of tie. After they take the course, then typically there's about a two to three day training course. Um, and we've moved a lot of it to online modules, so half of it is online where they're going through the different modules. And the other half is in-person coaching, well, virtual coaching also, where they actually take the pieces of what they've learned through the curriculum and they, um, and they practice it or they um, go through it with the group. Actually, sorry, let me backtrack because I'm thinking of presentations. For education classes, they would be um, trained by people in a virtual setting right now but usually it's in person and they actually get to do, um, go through the curriculum and materials together. For presentations, that's the part where half of it is online and half of it is the coaching because then they get to actually present part of that presentation um, and get coached on you know, their presentation styles, stories, and things like that. Um, support groups, we just ask that they attend at least one to two support groups. It's not required per se, but it's ideal so that they have an understanding of what the support group looks like, what the structure is, and then they can uh, attend the two, three day training um, and kind of see what the guidelines are and get practice. So in each one, they have practice in leading the groups um, before they actually lead a group. What's the typical timeline? Um, how long do they usually like stay a, a volunteer for, like just on average? Honestly, I think for a lot of people, like years and years. Oh, really? So yeah, wow. once they kind of join, they they love it so much, and it's something wow. that a lot of people believe in, and they know how much it's helped them. Wow. So they stay a volunteer for a pretty long time. A lot of people are kind of lifers. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's probably a huge, um, and to some degree, that's probably like, what, uh, what's, I'm trying to think of a correlation where, if someone thinks so highly of it, they're, they're willing to spend that much time afterwards. That that means that the NAMI uh, project, the whole ecosystem of it is probably such a very positive thing that it, you could see it in the way people are reacting to it. Oh uh, yeah, it's it started 30, a uh, little bit over, is it three decades? It started in the late 70s, 1979, was mm -hmm. when a couple of women, mothers, who had sons with schizophrenia, met over a kitchen table mm -hmm. and talked about their struggles and challenges. And then they met with other people, as another small group of about 10, 11, 12, and said, we need to do something about this. We need to educate people. We need to support people. And, and from there, that's how it kind of grew. And now we have an affiliate in every state and there's over 650 affiliates across the nation. And a lot of it is run by volunteers. So all of our support groups, education classes, presentations are all volunteers. And, and yeah, I think people who go through it know, know the power of education and support and building a community is really important um, to be able to, to help people understand that having a mental health condition, it's okay to talk about it and find ways to support each other through it. If I gave you a magic wand and this magic wand gave you six months to change anything for NAMI to better it in any way, what would you change from government to people to what, what would you change for the better? Oh, that's a big question. Um, the magic wand is changing people's 
understanding of mental health condition. But I think, I mean, it's, it's hard to do in six months, but we're slowly doing it over time. And imagine, you know, after a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, if we keep growing and expanding and we can get a whole community and impact all these lives to understand the importance of mental health, and what we do and just really erasing that stigma, eradicating that stigma, it kind of trickles down to everything else because of our politicians understood mental health the way that we understand it and could see that there is recovery, hope is possible, but we need the funding for it. Um, you know, I think the understanding that the funding would trickle down to those sources if, um, people in our communities, our coworkers, our schools, or whatever it is, sees the importance of mental health, we would take out more time to actually put towards whatever it is that needs to be done to, to promote mental wellness. Um, so yeah, just, just being able to educate people and raise that mental health awareness. With piece. that magic wand, if awareness is the, um uh, the thing that you want to change the most, like awareness in the sense of if you had that magic wand, would you have presentations all over the place in, in your region, banner ads everywhere, or, uh, what, what would be a way to get more people where, well, I guess I could, I could see you're thinking the magic wand as in, um, it just changes their mind and they, they, ha they lose that stigma about mental illness. Mm -hmm. um, is there a systematic way with that magic wand to do it? Meaning, I don't know, billboards. I have no, I, I have no idea. What are your um, thoughts? That could be one way, but I definitely think it takes more than billboards, but billboards, there is a group called, um, hope means Nevada with their initiative and committee. So they're, they're doing an amazing job out there with, raising the awareness and talking about it and getting people to reach out. But I definitely think it takes a lot more than that too. So that's kind of the first step. Um, just recently, last week, I went through this week long training and it was um, started by the, it was a collaboration between UNLV and the Center for Mind Body Medicine. And it brought community leaders together, about 150 of us, to spend a whole week um, really diving into mindfulness and talking about you know, ourselves and what our struggles were and how these tools can help. Just, I guess, to give a little bit of background. It's ran by this man who's a psychiatrist, um, started at Harvard, who's now teaching at Georgetown. He's developed um, these modalities for community-wide trauma healing. Um, and he's, he's done this research for over three decades and he's gone to a lot of war-torn countries like Syria, Serbia, Bosnia, and all that and has brought these modalities to those communities where in some communities, about 20% of the students, the kids had lost either one or both parents from the war. Um, some of them, about 80% were showing symptoms of PTSD um, because their their town was like blown up. A lot of their buildings are in, you know, shambles and stuff. Um, but after going through this, these uh, classes, I would call them, these group learnings is what they called them, they saw a healing process where these people developed signs of hope and um, these symptoms of, you know, that they were experiencing before of hopelessness and um, for a long time, just kind of stuck in this world of, of, uh, of just darkness, I guess they found a way out. So in my eyes, I think people need to experience what healing looks like because he really made a good point. Um, they would have a lot of, uh, whole group presentations and then we'd split up into groups of 10. So there's about 15 groups of us where we d uh, dig deeper. And during the presentation though, he said, we all go through trauma at some point in our lives. We will all experience a loss. We will all experience, you know, some sort of loss, whether it's through death, um, through a breakup, change of 
um, big life changes, losing a job, or you know, some of us go through traumatic events like accidents, car accidents, or natural disasters, or whatever it is. And in that sense, we all need to go through healing of those things. And some people either, um, you know, have found different ways of support, different ways of healing. But I believe that when we go through this healing together as a group and understand that it is, you know, part of life and to be able to open up and talk about it and share with each other this process of healing, that's what's going to really help when we start seeing it in that sense that, okay, people with mental health conditions, they just have gone through it and then perhaps might not have found the support that they needed to recover. Because we think, I think oftentimes people think of serious mental illness where, um, you know, there's just a lot of challenges. Um, but when people experience it for themselves and understand what that looks like and how important it is to tend to our mental health by opening up and sharing and talking about these things, um, that it would create a more empathetic community that's willing to listen and willing to be open and willing to be caring and, um, and yeah, breaking down that stigma altogether. Yeah. Huh. That stigma seems like such a huge, tough issue. Mm -hmm. hmm. I wonder if other countries have it similar or worse or less. I don't know. Um, let's take, well, I think Vietnam, let's take Vietnam because we are Vietnamese. I would think their stigma is a little bit, um, uh, the tradition is tougher. So I would think here in America is a little bit easier on stigma than Vietnam. Imagine, imagine running NAMI in uh, South Vietnam. <laughs> I've thought about it. I've honestly thought about it because I know in OC, they've actually translated the whole curriculum for family to family into Vietnamese. Oh, wow. And that was actually the reason why I had wanted to move to Vietnam at one point for at least a year yeah. to teach English there so I could learn how to read and write Vietnamese. Yeah. So I remember when they reached out to me and asked if I could help teach the class because it is you know, very stigmatized in our community and not a lot of people know about it. And I really wanted to teach a class, but I don't know how to read Vietnamese. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But I always thought like, man, what if we are able to bring this internationally and bring this curriculum and educate people about it? But yeah, we would really have to look at the system to see where are they at in their research? What is the community's understanding of mental health conditions and really meet the people where they're at? So there should be some cultural adaptation when we're translating these curriculums or materials or, um, you know, in whatever work that we do, because we can't just go into a community and say, hey, do this, it's not a one size fit all. Um, like, especially our Native American community or our Latino or Latinx communities or our Asian communities, it's very different in their different cultural um, experiences. Some countries might have gone through a war and that's where a lot of their trauma stems from currently and it could be passed on intergenerationally. So that's something to take into consideration. Um, other places, you know, might have experienced different things. So just really understanding what that cultural background is and taking the, the materials we have and the organization and, and plugging it there to almost like a McDonald's. If you look at McDonald's in every country, they really have tailored it to that culture. Yeah. Yep. And, and that's how I see it as. Like it's possible, but um, we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the McDonald's things makes me think about when I saw Pizza Hut in Vietnam. They had like seafood on top of their on their pizzas. Oh, I have not seen their Pizza Hut there. <laughs> and then, it's funny when they eat with chopsticks. They'll actually the whole like if a slice of pizza is like this, they'll actually kind of like uh, almost fold the pizza, but then they'll they'll use chopsticks to hold it and eat it. It's actually pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty interesting, but it's still pizza, right? And it's still yeah, the yeah. brand name of Pizza Hut. Yeah, so yeah, I yeah. would, my dream and hope would be one day to be able to expand it overseas in that sense. But um, really learning about the history and the culture first before jumping in and doing something like that, I think is going to be really important. Yeah. What, what's NAMI? What do you think NAMI needs the most in most in uh, in your region in Southern Nevada? Besides, uh, besides, I guess, awareness. Um, but funding. For, yeah, funding. Um, funding so that we can continue to expand and grow because there's only so much that we can do at the moment. Our bandwidth, 
our staffing is really small. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, just imagine if we had more people in each department or focused in different areas, the more reach we will have. But at this point, it's just uh, with our limited staffing um, and our volunteer base, we're able to do as much as we were able to. Yeah. So. What, where do you, what would you envision to, if you had an extra 30% funding, what would be the, what would you focus on? What would be <laughs> a position for someone to, to do more fundraising and development, <laughs> like actually a development person dedicated to that. Cause there are some organizations that will have a grant writer on their team. So it's kind of like investing for more investments. And okay. I, I think that would kind of be my wish list is to be able to find someone dedicated to that. Cause currently I'm kind of doing that with the help of some staff members, but to actually have someone that's that's very um, well versed in that area to have the experience and dedicate their time to that, so that I could dedicate my time to presenting and to developing relationships and other things. Because if I'm spending my time grant writing or spending my time, you know, planning for events for fundraising events, because that takes a lot of time too, it takes away from my other things that I'm doing. But right now, I'm having to just kind of balance everything to make sure that. You know, I'm doing a little bit of grants here. I'm doing some presentations. I'm doing meetings and relationship building and networking and building partnerships and whatnot. But um, yeah, ideally to be able to raise more funds to expand, that would probably be the next step that I'd want to do. Well, uh, what would you title that? What what title would that person be? Like fundraiser manager or? Um, development director, probably. Oh, development director. Yeah. Say, let's take it a step further. If you had a development director, what would be on your next list, wish list item? Oh, having an office. And at, <laughs> well, we have an office currently, but it's so small. It's like smaller than this room that we're in. It's a two-person office. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a lot of our materials. It's almost like a storage room because all of our materials are stored in there. Mm -hmm. What I envision... Um, so right now, we currently have our support groups out in the community. We do our presentations out in the community, which is great. I would still want to continue doing that. But if we could have um, a main home base where we also host support groups and education classes there and have it as an area where people who need resources can come and know, okay, this is the mental health resource building. If I need mental health resources, there's books or there's you know brochures or there's community resources that they can tap into or um, be able to have someone to come in and talk and help them through different processes. Like imagine a place where, I'm sure other hospitals and clinics have a case manager or someone that can help someone like sign up for Medicaid or find housing or um, things like that. But to be able to, like you can't have too many of that because yeah. there's such a big, huge need out there, especially during this pandemic where people have lost their jobs. Um, hundreds of thousands are, you know, facing possible evictions and the stress level is high. Um, just all sorts of things to know that, okay, there's a place I can call into because we just have that helpline. And also knowing, oh, there's a building I can go into and actually speak to someone or join the support group or join this education class um that would be my wish list so of number just, number one is development director number two is uh upgraded headquarters is that a way yeah. to put it and then let's take it one step further what's number three? Ooh, let's see take your time too yeah Yeah, that's just, there's like a tie between a lot of things. <laughs> so I'm just trying to think out of all those things, whether it's, is it providing training for new facilitators and staff? Is it providing training to the community? Is it investing it into um, youth programs? It, yeah, I, there's so many different places that we could take this into but i think i'd really like to focus on youth programs um, and that encompasses trainings for teachers like trauma training 
It encompasses holding teen support groups or having a teen text line or um, having even teen education classes. Similar, similarly um, outlined like how our family to family education classes, but that one's geared more towards adults, but actually having one for youth um, just because we know that our youth, especially in our community, is struggling so much right now. And um, to mitigate, you know, the effects of this pandemic on our youth community, we need to intervene now before because their their minds are so easily moldable. They're in a really sweet spot where there's a lot of resilience. And before this, the effects of these pan, this pandemic sets on them for the next decade, we can actually intervene and educate them for yeah, healthy the coping. Too. Exactly, to eradicate the stigmas, eliminate the stigmas, to really teach them healthy coping mechanisms, coping skills, um, and healthy thinking patterns, um, I feel like is so important. And to be able to, to do that for our community is, and really have, like we wouldn't be the only place doing it, but to be one of the places that is able to offer that, yeah. I think would be my top priority. Yeah. When if someone contacts NAMI, do they do they mention about privacy, their privacy or anything? Do, are they concerned about that, or how does NAMI deal with that? Um, typically, they're not because I feel that there's an embedded trust. Because anytime we're talking about you know people's lives, their stories, and mental health, that in our organization we know that confidentiality is one of the utmost importance. Even though we're not bounded by HIPAA laws because um, we're not clinical providers, we don't diagnose or bill, but confidentiality is so important that we don't go out and, you know, these are their own stories to share, but everyone who's gone through our programs have their own stories to share, and they understand and know that we don't want people going out and telling our stories. It's our story to share, so they respect that confidentiality and that privacy of other people's stories, um, unless, you know, there might be common themes that pop up or um, things like that, or unless if we ask permission from the people who are involved in that story to be shared. Um, but the, typically, I haven't heard of issues coming up like that, but there probably is concern. Yeah. And that's where the stigma comes from or that fear of talking about it. Yeah. Um, it just hasn't been brought up to me in any of my phone calls and, yeah. and all that. Because usually our support groups in our education classes, we make that statement ahead of time, mm -hmm. actually, to the whole entire group. Because it's not just the leaders, but it's the people in the group also to make sure that they know whatever is said in this group stays in this group. Yeah. And that confidentiality is so important. But it's that mutual respect because they're also sharing their you know personal parts of their lives and stuff yeah is nami is a non-profit yeah and then um it, so if someone attends a class calls in everything is completely free for the the participant it's at no cost to all participants whether it's our support groups education classes or presentations because the last thing that we want people to worry about is how they're going to pay for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, with that, I almost feel like when you earlier said it's a combination of um, uh, psychi psychologists, psychiatrists, and NAMI and working in combination. Almost since NAMI is free, it's almost like they should just go to NAMI first just because it's free. Get an idea of what NAMI is about, if it could help them, if, if they need more or something else. Uh, a supplement or whatever then they could go find a psychologist psychiatrist um, i think it just depends on the person's needs yeah. and how you know if they need that individualized support um to make sure that they go get it and you know it's just about being educated and informed and knowing what the resources are yeah yeah um so this we're reaching close to two hours but um, Already? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's uh, some final questions, um, but I could, I'll ask them. And then anything that you think about that can, with these questions, could be related to NAMI in any way, feel free, because this is a long format interview type of thing. So feel free uh, to go on tangents like crazy, however you want. Um, oh, this one's kind of interesting, because this one, I think, probably will connect with what you what you work with at a global or national level what do you think is the p biggest problem for humans and this this question was is is a template question that i ask everyone mm -hmm. so i would imagine 
I'm thinking that maybe NAMI would be in there as in people's awareness uh, awareness of mental illness. But anyways, answer however you yeah, want. Yeah, not just only mental illness, but the understanding of how important our mental health is. Because in the past, a lot of people understood. Um, let me just give an example. We have physical health, we have dental health, we have vision health, all that. There was a time in society where people didn't know that brushing your teeth every day helped prevent cavities. There was a time where communities, and there still are some communities in the world where not understanding the importance of washing our hands and how much that can prevent sickness and illness um, in the physical sense with viruses and bacteria and germs and whatnot. Um, so the hope is that with this new light of understanding mental health, that there are preventative measures we can take for mental wellness um, is a big factor because since we can't see it, people don't quite understand it or may not think it's important. But mental health, it affects everyone. It doesn't matter whether you know, you're know you a celebrity or a big CEO of a company or whether you're you know, just someone who's um, taking care of a family or a kid or just everyone and everyone that we all have mental health and there are ways to to live a mentally well and healthy lifestyle we just have to learn what those things are and practice it um, at a young age and of course you know trauma can happen to anyone too um, and that's a big risk factor for for developing PTSD or depression anxiety um, and other things and so understanding those aspects and knowing what we can develop as part of our toolbox to be able to kind of work through those challenges, I think is is probably one of the biggest things, especially during this pandemic. Because um, it is taking a toll on people's mental health, the stress, the loss, loss of normalcy, loss of life, loss of, there's going to be a lot of people going through um, what is it? Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I just slipped my mind. Isolation? Depression? Anxiety? Existential crisis. Oh, okay. Because they're losing their jobs and having to find a new identity. Um, a lot of people that are just having an identity crisis. And, you know, that could play into factors of depression, anxiety, whatever it is. Um, and some, some of the even more, you know, some of the other mental health conditions, we don't talk about those things either, but that, that could very well show up. But there are ways to, to kind of work on it and live a fairly fulfilling life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Next question is, uh, what do you know of cryptocurrency or what's your opinion of cryptocurrency? <laughs> I feel like I know very little. I've heard about Bitcoin and I've seen it grow up, go up so much over these past few months. Yeah, it's at um, an all-time high right now as we speak. I mean, I had... $4,000 a coin? Yeah, so my understanding of it is that it's, it's a new money system. And I think of it in the way that how credit cards came out before credit cards became a thing, or even before currency became a thing. There was a concept developed around it and people didn't really understand this exchange for paper or coins for services before that, that was just bartering, but then that had to be put in place. And then once we had our currency, the concept of credit cards developed, but people are like, it's a plastic thing. How, what do you mean? And so that understanding around that took a while to develop. And I think in the Western culture, we have it down, but there's other cultures that hasn't even fully embraced the credit card system yet. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting now to see cryptocurrency where it's such a new concept where not a lot of people understand, including myself, where I kind of have a general idea, but, um, but I'm not fully knowledgeable about what all the details of cryptocurrency is. And mm -hmm. what was your other question? Was there a second uh, part to that question? Just your opinion what do you know? My opinion is that it's just a, a new way of doing things. It's a paradigm shift. So there, of course, is always going to be some kind of pushback like there was with currency or credit cards. 
and now this new cryptocurrency system, but there most likely will become a time where our society or community or system adopts it. Um, and it's just gonna take time to kind of get into that space is what I think. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I think it's gonna take a lot of time. Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of time. Um, when they, when people mention like blockchain, um, and when you think about credit card, so you're, you're thinking of, it's just a digital currency of some sort. Um, mm -hmm. Have you heard um, mainly good things about it, bad things, or what are your opinions on it? I think, because we've had conversations about it before, <laughs> uh -huh. and just based on the conversations from some other people, I, I've heard mainly good things. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that it's our, our future of doing things, like even we think about it nowadays, um, or at least in our community, a lot of places have preferred credit cards because it's less contact mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in terms of you know currency exchange or even when we're purchasing things online it's hard to give someone a dollar bill over the internet but you could type in your credit card so i imagine that cryptocurrency is going to move into that space i've heard a lot of positive things in that um you know it's something that's going to be understood and adopted later on down the line and that it's, um, it's, I don't know exactly how it's a better way of doing things, but that's just my overall general yeah, 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 sense. Yeah, Cause, yeah. Cause I don't know the details a, of it yeah. to be able to explain what exactly it is. But yeah. I, I just pictured like credit cards makes life a lot easier. We yeah. could purchase things on the world wide web and do things yeah. that we wouldn't have otherwise been able to do yeah. much quicker. Yep. Um, I just picture cryptocurrency being some aspect similar to that, yeah. but in a different way. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I think where government is print, I mean, I, they're, they're talking about printing, an, uh, I think it's a $2 trillion for the next stimulus bill. Um, and then it's crazy that 5,000 page uh, stimulus bill, like there's stuff in there about giving money to um, other countries. There's bill, There's part of that inside that bill, there's talk about... Um, uh, shoot, I forget what it was, but there's things that are not so much not related to the pandemic and they're printing out $2 trillion and only a small chunk of that goes to citizens. It's just for cryptocurrency where you know where that money is. People can't just print willy nilly. You absolutely can't with cryptocurrency. So it's just, I don't know. It's crazy times to think about. I think the government's going to print out, I don't know if it's fifth, it if it's, if it's going to be close to 50% of all printed money ever, uh, the value of the printed money, this, this, they're going to print an extra 50% this year from the first bill and the second bill. Um, I, I might have the number slightly off. It might be 30, 40, 50% somewhere in there. Um, but that's crazy. Yeah. You can't print money. You can't print more with cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, I hope. I hope cryptocurrency comes and helps us. I think it's a tool uh, where you said earlier uh, uh, the analogy of a pen. A pen you could use it as a tool and help, or you could use it to stab people. I think cryptocurrency it's the same thing. That could be the analogy would be uh, the dollar bill could be the same thing. Dollar bill is just a tool. If you use it for a drug deal, it's not the fault of the dollar bill that you're doing the drug deal. Mm -hmm. an, uh, a, an, an illegal drug deal that's hurting people that's not the fault of the dollar bill you could do the same thing with the pencil if you sign a contract it could be a good contract uh, or it could be a bad contract that hurts somebody same thing with cryptocurrency i recently heard someone um a podcast where they're talking about so much uh illegal drugs and human trafficking is being is uh cryptocurrency is helping those systems and i'm like the dollar bill is the same thing. You can't just say cryptocurrency is at fault. Mm -hmm. I really think that was a really bad, I was really upset and I just want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think it's... cryptocurrency is a great tool. So hopefully it's, uh, hopefully humans will learn how to use it as a tool. Yeah. I think a lot of things are that way. I mean, whether we use it for, for good or bad, it's up to the person yeah. and, and how we educate the masses and the systems to be able to use these tools because just about anything we could use it for as a tool and something to help, or we could turn around and use it as something to hurt yeah, others. Yeah, so. exactly. Um, 
what do you know about Vietnamese culture or what do you find intriguing? So since you're um, uh, three-fourths Vietnamese, somewhere around there, mm -hmm. um, um, your, your understanding of the Vietnamese culture is quite a bit deeper. But either way, what do you, uh, what do you know or find the most in intriguing about the Vietnamese culture? Mm, there's so many things about Vietnamese yeah. culture, but I guess the biggest thing that sticks out to me, and especially because it kind of ties into work a bit, is knowing that we're a very collectivistic culture. Where you know having multi generational households is a thing, um, and just really working together is a thing, and that's just not that other people don't work together, but it's more so built into our culture versus a culture like you know the U.S. where we're more individualistic. Um, and what was the follow up question with that? Uh, most intriguing and um, or just what do you know about it or find most intriguing? Yeah, so, so the most intriguing part about that is just, um, I'm wondering because of that connection, especially Vietnam, like I, I am curious to know what is the rate of depression, anxiety, or the mental health conditions there because knowing that support and connection is one of the protective factors against mental health conditions, how does that play into being able to because if you go to Vietnam, it's a very different lifestyle than the U.S. where oh, yeah. you walk down a neighborhood and everyone's like out talking to each other. Your neighbors know each other. Families typically live in the same area and it's a norm to converse every day and to, you know, your work and your life is kind of all intertwined in that sense. And mm -hmm. it's, it's busy and people are there just to talk to each other versus here in the U.S. where we go to work, we might work, we may or may not work in a cubicle, and then we come home to our individual household. Mm -hmm. And that, that depending on where we're from, like maybe the Midwest or other parts of the U.S. where people do know their neighbors and the communities, but it's not an everyday thing where people are just out and about and your neighbor is like just 10 feet across the street from you or something or next door. Um, there's just more space here in that sense. So I'm just intrigued by the fact that it's a collectivistic culture and, you know, my mind is always thinking about mental health. Like how mm -hmm. does that impact mm -hmm. mental health? I know positively more. or negatively, actually. Yeah, no, I, I, I was thinking the same thing too, whether positive or negative. Um, because if you're in Vietnamese culture, if you're, you have to be, you have to share the house with your parents, even because I don't know if it's traditional or or economic. Mm -hmm. When I say economic, meaning maybe back in the past, children in Vietnam, grown up, never had the money to buy a house. I, I don't know if I have no idea. Yeah, right. So I don't know if it's economic or traditional. So if they're stuck at home with their parents, can they talk about their mental health at all? Traditionally, probably not, but um, but maybe the other flip side when you're saying is it good or bad, maybe it's good because they have a a ecosystem to talk to. They have their parents. If they ever feel sad, they just say something to their parents and their mm -hmm. or their neighbors. Because when I in Vietnam, I know more of my uncle's neighbors than any than how many <laughs> neighbors I know here. Like I could probably count like, gosh, I probably know ten of his neighbors there, and I know. <laughs> I don't know any neighbors here. <laughs> right? So, yeah, that's, that's the part that intrigues me the most. It's just, and it might have started out economically and then developed into tradition. Who knows? But I'm very curious and fascinated about that aspect to learn about the culture, the current culture, the history of it, and just how all that plays into everything. Yeah. Yeah, and maybe even in the Vietnamese culture, if you know those that many neighbors, even if you just sit down and have a coffee, then you just speak your mind. And, and that in itself is almost... almost Sharing is healing. Uh, no, totally, exactly. <laughs> they have many support groups yeah. every day, so I was like... <laughs> yeah, I've plenty of times in the past I've told um, certain friends where I say, friends are free psychologists <laughs> or psychiatrists, either way, however you look at it. Um, if you open up to your friends and they open up to you, your support group, that is what I feel like a psychiatrist and or a psychologist, both of them do to some degree. Psychiatrists, yeah, they, uh, they could prescribe drugs. But if, if you talk to enough of your friends, you get those things out and you, I feel like you become a healthier, mentally healthier human by 
talking about all the things that that upset you, all the things that um, that you have anxiety about. I definitely agree that it could be a protective factor to have a supportive group and people that you could share with. But in the sense that a psychologist or therapist, they have additional training because yeah. if someone's gone through a traumatic experience and sometimes just talking about it um, might not, you know, they, they need additional support and there's specific tools or strategies um, and things that needs to be done in order to help this person through um, coping with a major life change or challenge or whatever it is and that might require more specialized um, knowledge expertise and support but yeah i would agree with the fact that having friends it if you're not isolated and you're able to connect with others it would be helpful but it just made me think about the whole family unit again like yes the structure the physical structure is there in place but then my thought is, what are the communication skills or the communication styles or what is, because if, if we're in a family that's just arguing all the time and aren't honest or like lying my family. <laughs> or whatever it is, right? It's, it might not be the healthiest, but if they learn the tools of how to communicate effectively and how to open up and how to be there and support each other, how to encourage each other, how to, you know, talk to someone um, when they're feeling down in order to help them overcome this challenge. Um, that could be really helpful. So there are some places I think that might have the physical structure down, but then the social emotional development, that's the part that we don't quite see because that's the interactions between people. That could be a little different could use some improvement maybe i'm not sure about i'm connecting it correctly so are, are you kind of potentially saying this might just be one of the scenarios say say in the vietnamese culture the the kid lives at the house the parents the parents are kind of like they argue a lot and the parents are more um I don't, I don't, I'm trying to think of a better word than dictator. Like they don't, they don't want to listen Authoritarian. to, yeah, they don't want to listen yeah. to their child in any way. And the child brings up something that they're sad about, or the child may suggest something, but the parents don't want to hear. So are you, are that, is that what you were kind of mentioning where the structure may still not be uh, healthy yeah. for, the, for the participant? For yeah. The Cause um, you know, reading about different parenting styles, that sounds like more of an authoritarian um, or authoritative parenting versus, you know, and, and with psychology and research and all that, we've learned that it's healthy to express our emotions. Like you don't want to stifle a kid from ex expressing their emotions or feeling important or seen or heard um, because over time, what that does to their, their thought process and their um, mental well-being if this kid is just kind of taught from a young age that, you know, you can't talk, and you can't share, and you can't cry, um, not knowing how to reach out for help when they need it, not knowing how to express themselves, it gets internalized, and that could lead to other mental health problems, or it could be expressed in destructive ways, like through rage or through, you know, um, through yelling or breaking things or just these behavioral misconducts that we we think of it as um, you know behavioral challenge but it's really because they're not able to express themselves in other ways so we actually teach them how to journal or how to ex identify their emotions and say what they're feeling and provide that space just to listen to them that can make all the difference, but it's challenging with kids. Oh, it's yeah, yeah. a lot of work. I, um, given yeah. the uh, Vietnamese context and the Vietnamese war, I, my family definitely, um, I don't know how many other families are like this, but as in, say my, my mom, my aunts and uncles, so they experienced the Vietnam War anywhere between the age of two years old up to the eight uh let's see the oldest one was probably like probably close probably close to 18 years old and from the things that i've 
seen in documentaries or, re or research uh, material around the age of 14 and below is really where the brain f for a child is really um, can be easily impacted. So take the war. I mean, to go through a war at that age and then see how certain family members, for me, seeing them in, here in America now, I wonder how much of the war has had a lasting effect on them where they there are certain things that they do where I don't agree with and I, I what's a good way to say it um, besides saying it seems crazy <laughs> um, I don't agree with some of the things they do but then I think about well they came from that time and their brain may not think of certain things the way I, I'm able to because I was I was I'm a um, first world brat in the sense of I've never had a day where I never worried about food. Mm -hmm. I've always had shelter. So I'm super fortunate. So when I look at them, I have to think about what the war could have done to them. Um, I mean, 1975. And then so we're, we're, we're right, at that, right at that age. We're 2020 now. If 1975, those people came to America and had kids, that's kind of our, we are the kids of them. And mm -hmm. so our parents are all potentially had some pretty deep issues from the war. Yeah, trauma has a lasting impact. And there's um, this body of research on intergenerational trauma and epigenetics, which is how does trauma affect our genes and cause certain expressions in our genes to come out um, based on how you know the traumas affected our parents or our grandparents and then how the environment plays out with all of that so there's definitely a growing body of research and how that has trickled down from generation to generation and um, the effects of it on especially mental health too because those thought processes those behaviors those um, emotions because there's a biological component to it, how that all plays out and comes up. Um, it's really interesting to, to see how that all connects with each other. There definitely is some lasting impacts. And that's why I say things need to be culturally adapted because each culture has gone through um, some pretty traumatic events where one went through slavery, another went through genocide, another went through you know, just war and um, all sorts of things and understanding because there's a, a different viewpoint and different um, impacts in those areas and how how to talk and how to connect with those different groups is really important yeah have uh i'm thinking i wish i wish my aunts and uncles would go to like nami but I, that they're they would never i don't think any of the that any of them would admit to having any type of mil mental illness whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, huh. How does, you mentioned earlier that uh, your, you felt your grandma was dealing with some mental illness. Uh, does she know that you work for NAMI and or does she understand what NAMI is and or? <laughs> I think she has an idea that I work at a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but no, she has no idea what I do. <laughs> she just knows that I'm doing well and uh, I enjoy my work. <laughs> but yeah, to the extent of what exactly NAMI does, I don't even think my parents fully know or understand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite Vietnamese dish? Ooh. So I think my immediate thought went to pho. Like can't go wrong with pho. Uh -huh. It's on a warm or not warm, a cold winter day, mm -hmm. or just like feeling sick or whatever. Pho is delicious. But then I was trying to think of a meal at home that you don't typically find in stores either. Mm -hmm. And I don't know exactly what the dish is called, but my grandma would make the um, this uh, shrimp with green beans type of thing, and it was delicious. I I want to learn the recipe from her, mm -hmm. and. She doesn't make it anymore, so I don't know if she remembers how to or uh, what, but that was always probably because I had it so much growing up as a kid because she would cook for us mm -hmm. um, that that was one of my favorite dishes because of the sauce that was within. You could just pour it on the rice, uh, but I don't know what it's called. 
uh, was it like a brown type of sauce, a soy mm -hmm. sauce, or a... Yeah. Huh. Probably had fish sauce, probably. <laughs> probably. Either... It had either soy sauce or fish sauce, one of the two. It's like the two staple ingredients of Vietnamese food. <laughs> yeah. How do you like your pho, typically? What, uh, what meat? What, uh, a lot of um, thung or not a lot of thung? I like pho tai chin, and uh, I, d I actually don't like sriracha, okay. and I... <laughs> It's kind of funny because I eat it like probably a five-year-old kid. Where <laughs> I just don't even like raw onions in it. I like it for the smell, but I'll take it out and I don't put any extra veggies. Uh -huh. I'll put a little bit of thung in there, uh -huh. and that's how I like my pho. <laughs> so that thai, uh, that's how I, I usually get thai chin. That's actually pretty much what I get. Um, thai is the um, like the hammered, the the tender, uh, rare tenderized beef steak or rare beef. Yeah. Um, and then gin, gin is kind of, uh, what would that be in English? Um, I don't know. I think in the menus it's, it's, uh, titled as well, well, um, well done beef flank. flank? I think flank. Yeah, maybe. Uh, um, I don't even know what flank, I don't even know what part of the, <laughs> the cow or, so it's just not going to question it. It tastes good. Don't yeah, ruin yeah, yeah. it for me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, so just a little bit of hoisin sauce, which mm -hmm. hoisin sauce for the viewers that don't know, hoisin sauce is a plum based sauce that I would kind of describe. The closest thing I could think of is maybe like a soy sauce, but more like a teriyaki. I, I yeah. don't know how else to describe it. So, and then people that don't know pho, which pho is probably one of the most popular dishes uh, of the Vietnamese culture. Um, it's just a beef noodle broth, a beef noodle soup. Um, and then, and then those, uh, whatever to, uh, meats that you want. Um, yeah, I put, I put a decent amount of veggies on top, but I think that's cause I'm trying to be healthy. Like <laughs> I, if, if I, if, if, uh, someone would create this world where we didn't have to eat veggies, I would eat pho probably the way that you, I'll probably I get my veggies <laughs> other ways. I just, now I'm craving for pho. I feel like after this, I'm going to go get some pho. <laughs> if, I'd probably put more hoisin sauce. I, I like hoisin sauce. So I, I probably put a bit more on that. Have you done, have you done pho with the, um, uh, I forget what it's called. The like the Chinese donut is that what it's called? The Chinese donut. I think they call it Chinese donut. Yeah, yeah. It's like long, um, kind of. It doesn't. It's not yeah, really no, a shape. Yeah, what you're of, talking about. It's not even a shape of uh, a donut. <laughs> yeah, I think they do call it donut, but I'm trying to think of the Vietnamese name for it. Huh. Bun. I don't know bun, but it's just a f deep fried mm -hmm. pastry kind of. It's what did pretty. I used to eat it with. I used to eat it with other things jiao maybe the jiao yeah porridge. jiao rice porridge yeah or um yeah i think mostly that maybe hu tiu maybe. Uh, i don't know oh yeah i don't know so uh the last trip i went to vietnam with Nguyen where she said that's um culturally a lot of vietnamese like that chinese donut and with pho mm. so i was like oh okay I'll give it a shot. I do enjoy it, but yeah, I, I don't think in in the U.S. we usually do. Yeah, it that. yeah. I, I don't. I don't. I haven't seen it like that in the U.S. So it was new to me. It tastes fine. Um, it tastes as you would think the pho and then that that yeah. uh, Chinese donut. Um, that Chinese know. donut alone is good. So yeah, yeah, it tastes yeah. good with anything. <laughs> I would say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, last question on this list: What habits do you have that improve your life the most? I love that one. Meditation. That has been a life changer for me because... Go into depth about me meditation for me. Explain spiritually what you go through, how you feel it, how it affects your body, everything. Um, yeah. So I've always had anxiety since I was a teenager like to the point where it would make me late to things. I was afraid to speak in front of people. I was afraid to share. Like even in class... Ever since I was little, raising my hand and being called on would produce this like stomach churning fire. And I would like my body just gets anxious, but I, I like school. So sometimes I would still participate, but I would still get this like bodily sensation. Um, that's how bad my anxiety was. Like I used to, um, 
yeah, I'd not speak out in a group of people. I would just kind of be really quiet. Of course, that's changed over the years because I became a teacher and I just had to keep practicing over and over. That that churning fire thing, just to uh, focus on that for a second, is so it's like butterflies, but they're on fire? Or, yeah. Okay, I, I've never, I'm, I've never yeah. had that, so I'm, I guess I'm very, very fortunate. Like um, heart racing, trembling, and to the point where I would start sweating sometimes. So sometimes when I was doing events, like even though people tell me I'm, I was good at presenting, I would still get all those sensations and I just kind of had to jump into it and do it. Um, but it was really, it would get really bad sometimes where to the point where I just have to step away and not do anything. I've definitely had the butterfly feelings. Like if, if I had to go do a presentation, oh yeah, my heart starts yeah. pumping, the butterflies feeling. But when you say the burning, I'm like, holy shit, that sounds terrible. <laughs> like I, I'm trying to, trying to, I'm trying to empathize with it. Um, so uh, think of like going up a roller coaster. I don't like roller coasters. Yeah, so, yeah. so like that stomach sinking feeling. Oh, almost. okay, okay, okay. Um, but the drop isn't quite as heavy. I mean, it's just it just kind of stays there at that. Okay. okay. That rising uh -huh. moment. Okay. Because it's you know our body going into fight or flight mode. Okay. Um. So yeah, I've always had that since I was younger and there's times where I'm okay and then other times when it just would get really bad. Um, but I found meditation, I would say about four years ago by almost by accident. Like one of my good friends went on this meditation retreat with her boyfriend over New Year's um, from Christmas to New Year's and she was telling me that she was going to be gone for 10 days. And they were going to take away her electronics and stuff. And I remember initially thinking, like, where are you going? Are you joining a cult? <laughs> like, after this, are you going to be the same person? I was really worried and scared that she was going to change completely or just cut off all ties afterwards because I had no idea what she was doing. But she came back and explained her experience and said that she had, it was tough and hard, but she had a great experience and told me that it was something right up my alley of some things I enjoy doing. Or, you know, just in that mindfulness space, yoga, all that kind of stuff. Although there wasn't any yoga in this 10-day silent meditation retreat. So that's how I first got introduced fully to experience meditation. I just jumped into a 10-day silent meditation retreat. And ever since then, I would say it's completely changed my life. Um, I will admit that initially, because of all the past traumas, there's a lot of things that would come up, especially during that 10 day and after, especially when I was meditating. So there's... So you went on the, t the same 10 day thing that they did? Yeah. Okay. Um, so my initial experience with meditation was that there was a lot of traumatic flashbacks to childhood traumas. And, but what happened throughout the 10 day meditation retreat and after, because I continued the meditation practice, I mean, it wasn't perfect like I wasn't meditating every day for an hour but I would try to meditate about an hour here and there I would do it for like a couple of days a week or a few times a month and forget about it because I got so busy and then I would try to do it again and it'd go back and forth like that but over time there's this awareness a self-awareness that opens up because you're sitting there and there's different types of meditation techniques and different types of meditation practices. But in the one that I did, it's, it's known as a body scan. So it's called Vipassana. And through this body scan, you're just sitting and being aware with yourself, like you're an observer of, of yourself. So emotions might come up, agitation might come up, restlessness, sleepiness, whatever comes up, thoughts might come up, some from memory, some just imagination, like things that just never happened. And you're like, I don't know these people. I've never been in this situation. How did this come up? So it's really interesting if you sit in it long enough in a meditation for like 30 minutes to 60 minutes. And, and sometimes it would just, realizations would come up, like connections to, oh wait, this is why this happened, or this is why I do this, or, or it's just like kind of, problem solving but the intention is not to problem solve the intention is just to sit there and notice your breath pay attention to your breath if a thought comes up just notice the thought and let it go it's not to sit there and focus on anything other than your body 
how you're feeling, because sometimes aches and pains might come up too, out of nowhere. And some things would really hurt. And the whole idea is just to sit and breathe through it. And um, so the same goes for life, where you learn to translate that into your life. Like uncomfortable situations might come up, let the feelings arise, feel the pain or the guilt or the uncomfortableness or uneasiness, whatever, breathe through it and let your body experience these sensations. And over time, um, the flashbacks and the trauma, especially going through therapy, it became less and less. So now it's become more of a tool of like, okay, whenever I get really anxious, um, and okay, I'll, I'll go back a little bit. Before I was doing it when I got really anxious and it would help me kind of calm down because looking into science and the biological factors, they know that when you go back to your breath and focus on your breathing and you control your breathing, you can actually control like your, your heart rate and how your body responds and all that. But then now I'm, I'm working on having it as more of a daily practice. So it's not perfect yet, but I'm trying to do it you know, at least three to five times a week, ideally every day, but starting out each morning with the, even if it's just five minutes, I think still helps. Um, ideally, an hour is my end goal, but I just try to do about 20 minutes, um, 20 to 30 minutes, depending on the time. Ideally, I'd like to also do it at night too, before I sleep, the last 20, 30 minutes. And what it does to my day when I wake up, if I start out with a meditation, the rest of my day, there's mental clarity. There's less anxiety. I can just think of things and there's just le less mental fogginess, um, less irritation. And especially when I was in that 10-day meditation retreat and over time, there's just something that happens and it's hard to explain because you have to experience it because it's like me trying to explain what does happy feel like? What does sad feel like? It's an emotion, right? It's what you feel inside. But there's more empathy and compassion for others. There's more understanding. It's just something that happens inside biologically or mentally, emotionally, that helps to connect all these things together. And because we understand ourselves better, we learn to understand others better. When we can understand our own behaviors and reactions, why we do things, where our thoughts come from, the better we're able to understand and be compassionate to others. If there's uh, someone that wa that's just starting out on it, when you mentioned um thinking about just your breathing, closing thoughts out. If someone were to be brand new to it and just give it a shot, is going to a 10 day retreat something to start out with or is that more advanced or should they just look in a book? Should they go online or how would you suggest someone to get started? I think it just really depends on the person. Um, I would say I use Insight Timer, the app, and that's a great app to start. It's a free app. And there's guided meditations in there or there's just timers so if you just want to sit there quietly you could do that you could start out with just five minutes ten minutes or it kind of goes um, up the chain in time length so yeah i would just say starting out with just sitting with our breath but there's also moving meditation too so like yoga is considered a moving meditation if you're walking if you're biking like mountain biking or just regular biking meditation um, has been repackaged in the Western world as mindfulness. And it's just being aware and being present in the moment. So you could have mindful eating. You could have mindful, like when we're sitting here in this discussion right now, are our thoughts going to, oh, what we used to do and thinking about the future and thinking about work or thinking about other things? Or are we actually present in this moment and being aware of our sensations, like using our five senses to really be engaged in this moment hmm. is what I would say meditation and mindfulness kind of encompasses where we're not judging. So even if we're sitting there and meditating, but thoughts keep coming up or we're restless, we're not judging it as good or bad. We're just sitting there like, okay, this thought came up. 
back to our breath. Or if I'm doing a moving meditation, like when I'm doing yoga, what I love about it is that I'm in that space, in that moment, just moving my body and that's it. I'm not thinking about work. I'm not thinking about anything else. So meditation can actually take lots of forms and look differently for everyone. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. No, yeah, yeah, no, mm -hmm. it was good. Um, so you use that, you said uh, you use that app. What was the name of the app for the- Insight Timer. Insight Timer. Um, in your, have you looked at multiple uh, meditation books and whatnot? Is it usually the same general message to just, to be aware of yourself at that moment as in breathing and whatnot? Is that, is that what most meditation books kind of get at or? It's a little bit different because there might be guided meditation where you actually are listening to someone guide you through visualizing a space or something that you're doing. There might be the Vipassana meditation, the body scan, where you're paying attention to your body and your breath. There might be the moving meditation, which is all these other different forms that I just talked about. And I think my knowledge is just limited to those three right now, but I, from what I understand and know, there's a lot of different types of meditations. Like, I think there's transcendental, um, meditation or other forms where there's a different framework but i don't know the details of it um but they all have their different purposes and serve their different um benefits it's just you know which one resonates with the person more like i love the body scan one but i have friends who are like you know what i don't enjoy that i'd rather do guided meditation um there's two uh podcast people sam harris and uh, joe rogan where they mention meditation meditation and psychedelics they say psychedelics is like a um a super fast way to get to what if it took you if it took someone maybe a lot of years to meditate and they get this um this feeling of potentially an outer outer body experience where psychedelics can shoot you there within 15 minutes um do you know of that or have you heard of it or what do you think about that? I did watch a documentary on it where they kind of talked about the chemicals that's released in the brains when we have extensive meditation and extensive meditation practice and the chemicals that are released on psychedelics. I mean, I don't know from experience, but it, it sounds interesting in that sense that because, you know, when the chemicals are released in our bodies, we feel a certain way from it. And if the two chemicals are similar, enough to where it produces those same like similar sensations or emotions or whatever it is um it sounds like it could be possible so yeah um if someone says that they d they don't think meditation would help them what would you what would you say to them for them to just try it anyways or um i think it's it's just, just with anything that in life the person has to want it and has to, yeah, they just have to want it, um, to want to do it. So the way that I think of it, it's like working out. You don't go to the gym one day and say, the gym sucked, I'm never doing it again, it didn't work. <laughs> or are you going to stop because it hurt the first day? Because guaranteed you're gonna be sore for a while if you haven't gone to the gym in a while. And I see meditation as exercise for the mind and it's the same way where it might be painful at times, it might not be as great, but eventually in the long run, typically it is good. But say for example, if someone had an injury, like a knee problem, well, going in and lifting weights and doing all these things isn't going to be good for their knee. So they have to be careful in the same sense that if there's a lot of trauma or other instances that might impact someone sitting in meditation for a long time, because if these thoughts come up, and they don't have the tools to either um, work through it or, you know, there might be needed additional therapy needed or whatever it is. Um, it's the same sense. So it, it's a different concept. I mean, it's the same concept, just in a different context in that this is for our mind. So, you know, it's like, would you tell someone that the gym isn't good for you? Well, it's like depending mm -hmm. on, yeah. you know, the person and where you're at and what you're able to do and how how much you can do and all that for meditation for you do you find doing a five minute segment or a 30 minute segment and where how does it affect you 
and what do you feel in those differences? Um, I think five minutes is okay, but definitely doing 30 minutes, there's a huge difference in my day in that it's like I'm able to regulate my emotions better and I'm in a better mood. It's a natural mood stabilizer for me. Um, Cause I mean, there are people who have to take medication and I at one point did for my depression and all that and anxiety, but it has so many side effects that if I'm able to do it through meditation um, and exercise and all these other tools, right? that I really appreciate that it's able to help me kind of keep this um, level-headedness and not feel so much anxiety throughout my day and just feel like this positive energy and mood just from meditating, just from sitting still and sitting quiet and connecting with myself. And sometimes I learn things about myself I didn't even realize. And it's not forced thinking either. You're not sitting there like, okay, I have to think about this problem and how I'm gonna solve it. Like that's not the purpose. It's just giving ourselves time to be still and somehow our mind is working in the background, which is different from sleeping because when you're sleeping, you go into like REM sleep and your brain waves in your mind. It's working a little bit differently than when you're awake. But how often do we stay awake without thinking and working on something else? Because yeah. either we're on our phones, we're watching TV, we're talking to someone, doing work, playing a game, doing something. But just imagine giving yourself that 30 minutes to be awake, but to just tend to yourself and be in this moment and just be yeah, without distractions. Mm -hmm. It's just, I can't even <clears throat> fully explain it. I feel like it's something that people just have to experience. Hmm. And then from the 30 minutes to the 60 minutes, 60 minutes is going to be even much more better than 30 minutes. Um, huh, that's interesting. I want to try that. When you say you can't, uh, it's hard, hard to explain. Yeah. I'm trying to find it's a like way someone to... asking, "What what is love? What does love feel like?" <clears throat> and you could we could do all these things to explain how it's observed, what it looks like, but to feel it and experience it is so different than reading about it. Same yeah. thing with teaching someone how to ride a bike. It's like you could read about it all you want. You can look at all the pictures, study every single part. But until you get on that bike, that first time you're going to fall or even yeah. snowboarding. Yeah. It's not as you can look at it and say, oh, you just get on the bike and pedal or oh, just get on the board and go down the hill. But anyone who's learned how to ride a bike or snowboard knows that it's not that easy. Mm -hmm. And it's different mm -hmm. muscles that you're um, using. I think the best way to explain it is they have done brain scans on people who meditate often and they have broken it down to different brain waves. Like there's like, um, and I don't remember what order they go in, but there's like the theta, the beta and something else. But once you can get your brain waves to slow down enough, you kind of get into this meditative state that's like very calm and relaxing mm. um, versus like in a brain wave where it's like working. It's not a bad thing, but it's just, being able to, to calm yourself down and regulate um, your own emotions and, and all that hmm. is what they at least show on the brain scans. Do you think most, most people should meditate every day? Yeah, I'm pretty biased towards it because, yeah. of course, I have a practice of my own. Um, it is challenging in the beginning because yeah, our mind does wander. We get restless, things hurt and all that. But I think overall the benefits that I see from it, and it doesn't cost anything. You yeah. don't have to go anywhere. Yeah. Um, it doesn't cost money to go to your room and meditate. Um, and the benefits of it are so huge that yeah. And especially I think when we experience something good and we know that it feels good and it helps um, that we want other people to experience it too. It's kind of like asking, should everyone exercise? <laughs> like we know it's a good thing, yeah. but it's hard to do. <laughs> when you did the 10 day retreat, were you already into meditation before that or the 10 day retreat was your introduction to meditation? The 10 day retreat was my introduction to meditation. Looking back, do you, would you suggest someone try that or was that way over your, do you look back and think that was way over your head? Um, 
I, I always encourage people to try it because it was life changing for me. But I know my experience during it and the trauma that resurfaced during that time, which was really interesting, which prompted me to go to therapy because the way that they even explained it in the discourse. So at the end of the day, there's like an hour discourse of the guru or the teacher kind of explaining what's happening. The way that they talked about it and explained it, it's like doing a surgery, a mental surgery of the mind and going deep into your subconscious and uncovering all that stuff. So stuff comes up, things that you don't even remember. It was so long ago. And, and that was what was happening. And I don't think I knew that at the time and I wasn't quite ready for all that, but it was the hardest and best thing that also happened because it forced me to go through and deal with all those things and really take a look at it and say, okay, what has been pushed down and repressed in my life so much that it's impacted me now that I just haven't taken a look at. Now it's resurfacing again because I didn't deal with it the first time. So now that I've dealt with it because of all these years of therapy and all that that I've done, it's I have a new outlook on it. So the next time that it does come up, I don't think it'll affect me the same way because I've processed through it and I've looked at all these different traumas and said, okay, Yes, this happened, and I understand it now, and these are my tools um, to be able to, to help myself kind of get through. It's, it turns from thoughts, like the emotions aren't attached to those thoughts as much anymore, in a good way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because with trauma, um, usually when thoughts come up, these emotions come up with that thought or that memory. But after processing it and being able to go through it, um, I can remember. It's not like I forgot what happened. Yeah. But I'm able to, to kind of just sit through it and not have all this emotional reaction to it, yeah. which I think is a good thing in a sense that, you know, these things were brought up during that 10-day meditation retreat. That was unexpected. Um, so just being prepared, especially for people who've gone through some child trauma, that they have support afterwards and go to the therapy and you know do the things that they need to do in order to process and deal with the things that does come up and it doesn't happen to everyone um so for some people especially if there wasn't any major childhood traumatic events that you know it might be a totally different experience that was just my experience it, what what's understood in these meditation retreats is that everyone has a very different experience and a t different takeaway from it so yeah how long have you been you said was it eight years you've been doing med meditation did you say I'm no I, the meditation retreat i went in 2015 so about, about five, five years, years. Yeah. yeah but i started yoga um back in i would say 2011 so it's been a good nine years and that as a moving mode um meditation mm. really helped with the self-awareness and like i said realizations would just pop up like new understandings where I was like, oh, where'd this come from? I could just be doing something and just something would click. But the interesting thing is with all the new research that's coming out, explaining what actually happens to like our brain when we're engaged in meditation, like the neuroplasticity of the mind and how meditation practices can help, you know, grow these new neural networks. Um, it's really fascinating. It's a very new, newer field, I think. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, although people have been doing research on it and have been practicing it, research has been done on it for decades. The practice has been in place for hundreds, if not centuries, um, hundreds of years or centuries. And, um, but yeah, it's, I think, in the field of research and having it be more widespread to the masses, it's just newer. Um, but that's why we're seeing more people, more yoga studios, more meditation practices, um, more things popping up because it's actually being implemented in like the VA system and clinical practices um, and all that. And people are seeing how it changes and heals someone. Yeah. Does anybody else in your family uh, practice meditation? No, not real. Not that I know of. I mean, I, I try to encourage them and tell them about it too. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
I want to say maybe my sister, but I'm not 100% sure. Is the, uh, I'm, think, or I'm thinking the Buddhist religion is pretty big in meditation, right? Um, is, I wonder what that, I'm just randomly thinking what that stems from. I wonder what the history of it, but. So it's interesting because in that Vipassana retreat, they do talk about it also, and they talk about the history of the Buddha. Um, he has a really long name that I can't pronounce, but mm -hmm. the Buddha in India that started the meditation practice Vipassana. So the story that was told by that retreat is that there's this man who's a prince, and he you know, lives this cushy lifestyle, amazing world, and he goes out into the town and witnesses all the suffering of the people and recognizes that there's a lot of suffering out there and how do you end suffering? And so eventually he leaves his you know, castle or whatever he was in, um, goes out to the mountains to kind of explore to find out what is the antidote to suffering and finds himself in these meditation um, spaces like meditating under a tree and all that and finding out that not attaching ourselves to things um, is there's like a few principles in the Buddhist philosophy so it does stem from Buddhism in the sense that there's you know in a Buddha it's actually a very general term and could apply to a lot of different people um, kind of like Dalai Lama and and because it worked for him, he went back and taught it to people who were close to him. And they found that that was somehow allevi alleviated their suffering, this meditation practice. And from there it grew. So then other people would come to him and, and he was teaching it to like dozens of people and then hundreds of people and then thousands of people that would just come to him because they would hear from other people or see the changes in them. Um, so it does have some kind of um, Buddhist background, but then people don't see Buddhism as a religion. It's more of a philosophy or a way of mm -hmm, living. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And even today, like, you know, you don't have to believe in the history or the story of it or how it started. You don't have to practice all the other principles. Just taking the, the meditation out itself and doing that part alone and experiencing the benefits and the effects of it is I think what's important from it regardless of how it started or what the story was and and all that because yeah. you know there could be some um, controversy over that and whatnot when you bring religion in but um, it definitely can be used separately from religion but there is in the sense that the spirituality component I think it's just going to come from it because you're connecting to the self and your intuition and and all that so it just kind of comes naturally yeah i think this meditation is a good topic to end on um but i think one of the important things that i want to uh, bring up is if someone wants to contact you about nami what uh how should they contact you uh and we should also mention your name so go ahead and say that afterwards and then um uh there was one other thing about nami um if they contact you and if they want to donate um i think you said donations through the websites so um, yeah, what's maybe a best way to contact you, email or phone number, and then, and then your name. Yeah, so our website is um, www.namisouthernnevada.org. On there, under um, ways to get involved, there's a Give Now button that people can go and donate. Um, they can contact either our info at namisouthernnevada.org email account or me directly at tdang. Um, D-A-N-G at NamiSouthernNevada.org um, or if they call into our helpline the phone number is 702-890-9729 and that person can direct them to resources or how to navigate our website as well. Uh, T-Dang because uh, your name is Trin, Trin Dang. Dang. Yep. <laughs> uh, um, uh, T-Dang, no, no uh, spaces, no, um, or not spaces, yeah. um, dots or anything, underscores? No. Nope. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, I guess we'll call this the end. Thank yep. you for stopping by. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs>